favorite drink? Beer. Beer. <laughs> I like to say on that bombshell. You should mind your language, actually. Bombshell. Uh, yes. <laughs> Got to be careful uh, what, I, what I say. Oh, we'll be heading off. I'll give myself that. <laughs> Name a food that gets bigger when it's cooked, Mr. Alam. He was he was flexing his educationist muscles with the last one. Cooking has knocked me out, I'm afraid. <laughs> oh, <laughs> someone who doesn't do the cooking. <laughs> hot dogs. I didn't hot, know hot dogs. dogs. <laughs> they don't yes, get big. Assalamu alaikum everyone, we are back, the Unscripted podcast is back and we are as unscripted as ever, alhamdulillah um, In the last few weeks, the Trojan horse scandal has uh, hit our um, Muslim Twitter and, and uh, you know even mainstream news here and there And uh, we thought, hey, it's an amazing opportunity to launch, relaunch the Unscripted podcast with two very special guests We've got Professor John Homewood to my right, he's the uh, professor of social sociology at Nottingham University and co-author with, along with um, Teresa O'Toole, the book he literally wrote the book on uh, Trojan Horse. We'll put the link in the description below. And to my left, we have Tahir Alam, who is the, or well, depending on who you ask, maybe the mastermind behind some kind of uh, grand Islamist plot. Uh, he arrived in a, a giant wooden horse. Just kidding. Um, and Tahir Alam, yeah, and he needs no introduction. So, assalamu alaikum, everyone. Uh, and uh, and hello, <laughs> to hello. <laughs> Johnny, because you can get a salam, uh, a salam as well. But um, yeah, I, I found myself in a really awkward position the other day. Uh, I was explaining to a young kind of uh, personality on social media, uh, you know, with a large following. Uh, <coughs> I was found myself in, 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 in an odd position of actually trying to explain what the Trojan horse fiasco was, because this person maybe he's, I don't know, 20 years old or something, and it's, it's getting, you know, getting to like what seven years eight eight nine years, eight years now um and i was trying to explain the actual the the impact of this thing you know and i thought um uh, and i realized you know, w w you know i was obviously quite um <laughs> awake and uh, you know a, an adult when it happened but maybe we should rewind back before we jump into uh, i want to talk about a lot of things especially you know yourself you 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 read the you wrote the book on this uh, Tahir Alam, you're at the center of this this scandal. Let's rewind a bit um, because you know this this big uh, investigative journalist uh, journalism series has come out with Hamza Saeed and um, what's the other guy's name again? Brian Reed. Brian Reed, uh, excellent piece of work. Um, before before we jump into that, how would you describe what the Trojan horse affair was? I mean, just to complete somebody who. You know, was an alien, uh, just or he's been living in a cave for the last, you know, ten years. What, how would you describe what it was? What actually happened? Uh, the impact, you know. How, uh, and I was just kind of like a deer caught in the headlights. Probably like you are now, <laughs> because, you've been, because you've been, you know, uh, writing about it, discussing it, thinking about it for so long. How would you just introduce someone to it? Well, it's an uh, interesting question, a question I've been asked many times, and mm -hmm. uh, I've suffered the similar kind of uh, predicament as you have, really. How do you capture the notion? Um, from my sort of personal point of view, as well as a Muslim community point of view, um, I would sort of, the words I would use are, you know, it was an offensive, it was an attack on the Muslim community, is the way I would kind of capture that uh, in, a, in a few words, mm -hmm. uh, which... Um, I think some of the uh, more deeper, lasting impacts have been that it created a sense of fear in the Muslim community, a uh, based on the idea you were outsiders and that your normal kind of participation within a democratic society, you know, was not welcomed, mm. um, and, and uh, you know, and, and, and that effect, if you like, you know, was um, uh, came came, well came around in. in, in in terms of implementation of prevent, for example, within yeah. public sector yeah. and so on, so those are the lasting effects, really. And um, and people who come afterwards, of course, they will not know that these things were not there anymore. So it's not part of their experience yeah. uh, how it was before all of that. Um, and uh, even requests, for example, like requesting prayer facilities uh, within schools, yeah. uh, is becoming a bit challenging. And uh, 
it's scrutinized and put under the microscope now, which was never ever the case before the Trojan Oath affair. Mm, you mm. know, the schools generally, in the vast majority of cases, if you put a request in to do that, uh, they tried their best to kind of accommodate that, uh, you know, and not always, of course, but predominantly, that was the kind of culture we had. Yeah. And a cultural shift has been created where obviously you now have to validate yourself and you go through some kind of scrutiny or surveillance if you make those kind of requests yeah. whether you are within the nhs or the education system or uh, you know uh, uh, and other areas too yeah john how would you how would you yeah. um, <coughs> well that's absolutely right yeah. i think i would go back to 2011 and say mm -hmm. something happened in 2011 that prepared the ground and then the ground dramatically shifted after mm -hmm. that so the first thing is the relaunch of the Big Society project, and that was associated with the development of the Academy Schools Programme, which took schools out of the control of the local authority and put them under the con direct control of the Department for Education. It was argued that it would empower communities, communities could get engaged in their schools and, and develop mm. them. But at the same time, David Cameron, because he had launched the Big Society Project, also announced that there was a problem of Muslim communities being self-segregated and being outside mainstream British values. So you had two contradictory developments, one suggesting to people they should get involved in schools, <laughs> and the second is telling them that you should be a bit careful of Muslims getting involved in schools. But nonetheless, a local authority okay. like Birmingham had got a long-standing school improvement program and, of course, is an a ethnic minority majority city. So it's well used to the idea that the uh, engagement with the community should be an engagement with a multicultural community mm. and that uh, uh, Muslims mm. in Birmingham would be at the heart of that. And so what you had was a successful program of improving schools in Birmingham in which Muslim educationalists became involved and believed that what they were doing was part of the empowerment of their communities. Mm -hmm. And I think it was one of the most extraordinary success stories in the context of integration, if you put it like that, uh, in Britain. So the attackers to here describes it upon Muslim educationists and upon Muslim communities, mm -hmm. I think was was a shock because it occurred in a context of considerable success and considerable buy in in the uh, local area. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What we discover is that there were important interests, let's call them the interests of established professionals, established groups who were facing uh, you know, the disruption of their access to privileged positions, senior positions within schools, senior positions within administration. And I think part of that backlash is a backlash of middle-class white mm -hmm. professionals. I'm um, sad to say. Yeah, I mean, picking up your point about um, th you know, the uh, culture of participation was welcomed uh, mm -hmm. within education. And as part of that, when the shift in policy happened 2011, mm -hmm. uh, big society uh, idea, and uh, the free schools project was launched, uh, as well as the academization, uh, kind of um, aggressive academization of programs, uh, this is something that I actually promoted and campaigned for because I was at the Association of Muslim Schools at the time. So I did presentations up and down the country encouraging uh, people to participate. Indeed, there was a good response, actually, from uh, various communities, including uh, uh, people from the Muslim community as well, who were wanting to establish new schools. Um, and I know that um, at the same time, uh, so I mean, the, the schools that were established, some of them ap applied for uh, free school status in Bradford. Um, mm -hmm. There was a school that was granted there. There was another one applied in Huddersfield, Nottingham, and so on. What we found, of course, as part of this um, uh, shift, even before Trojan Horse, actually, these schools were, uh, you know, uh, were stripped of their license. Mm -hmm. And that's not something in the public domain, but that's something I dealt with um, as a, uh, you know, as a, somebody responsible at the Association of Muslim Schools. Mm -hmm. So there was this um, 
kind of a contradiction uh, which actually was playing out in real life as well, mm. although not so visible. Um, mm. So just know. to bring any listeners up to speed, so you are one of many you know, Muslim educationalists who became governors, who became uh, you know, or recruited head teachers mm. and, and staff and so forth at various schools, mm. and uh, that happened to be in Muslim majority areas, uh, in order to raise standards mm. for from fa- you know, transforming failing, failing mm. schools to you know, outstanding ones mm. over, over, over a short period of time. By the way, if, um, I mean, the, the New York Times podcast, The Treasure Hunt Ho- Horse Affair, um, it, it has a, 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 a magnificent kind of uh, setting of the scene, you know, the context, and it goes into the kind of a, the, the, the history. I really, we really recommend uh, people listen to that if they haven't already. Um, but just to summarize, you, you know, you were in... Involved in your local communities and trying to you know, uh, improve the, the education prospects for you know, inner, sk- in inner city uh, school children. Yeah, I, I think one and of the things that people don't sometimes yeah. appreciate that within the inner city scene generally, mm-hmm. uh, it was widely accepted by local authority and by central government as well. And amongst the teaching fraternity also, amongst the leadership of schools and so on, that the children within these uh, inner city schools... Um, uh, where our school was, it was accepted that these children will not achieve as well. It was kind mm. of an uh, unwritten rule, and it was also accepted by Ofsted as well. And the reason why I say that, because I've had conversations, I've Ofsted infected myself as well. Yeah, you were so part so of Ofsted. Yes, yeah. so, so when I had conversations with you know, my colleagues, and I asked them, I said, how come you know, this particular school's got 25% result? How come you didn't put it into special measures? Why didn't you do it? So they had a different benchmark, mm. uh, basically, for these schools. They thought, because they yeah. are inner city schools, <laughs> and they got their socioeconomic deprivation factor and their drugs and their crime rate and whatever, that it was accepted that a low standard was acceptable for them. What we did um, in relation to the schools that uh, you know I, we ran, well, that over a period of time, we actually completely shattered this narrative completely into smithereens. Nobody could come and argue because we had the highest deprivation. Free school meals, 70%. You don't get higher than that in the country. What was the, uh, what was the statistic of failing before you joined? I remember in the podcast there was, there was a, a, like a turning moment for you. Mm-hmm. Turning point where you were watching some BBC panorama. What was it called? Uh, underclass, underclass in underclass in Parda. Underclass yeah. in Parda, mm-hmm. and you are like okay, that that was your kind of road to Damascus moment. You want you want to you want to kind of uh, uh, enter the education scene. Yeah. I, I remember hearing so a shocking statistic there about yeah, probably my Trojan something. moment. I think <laughs> rather than Damascus <laughs> moment, <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean it was a. <laughs> bit late, <laughs> bit late never. Right. So um, it was. Um, I, I mean, I, I did uh, watch this particular program. It kind of transformed my thinking, yeah. um, and I wanted to do something. I wanted to participate. And uh, what was not in the podcast was that uh, after watching this program in 1993, mm-hmm. uh, within a few months of that, in fact. I went to Parkview School, I just knocked on the door, I just went one of the days and I went into reception and I said, uh, could I speak to somebody from the school, maybe the head teacher? And um, I went and uh, his name was John Drury, he was the head teacher at the time and he also was a teacher who taught me um, French and, but he was a history teacher so he taught me history. So uh, John Drury was head teacher, so I, um, I knocked on the door and they said, there's an ex-pupil of yours, he wants to talk to you. Uh, so, uh, so John then was uh, kind and polite and he, he came out and he was honoured to receive me. Mm-hmm. And uh, he said, oh, it's n- uh, lovely to have you, Tahir, you know, come on in. Sabah, um, bien merci. Yeah. That's <laughs> <laughs> so I went in and uh, he offered me a cup of tea. I sat in his office and I said, you know... Um, I'm kind of uh, interested in making a contribution to the school and, uh, you know, perhaps I can become a governor or something. I heard that you can become a governor. I said, that's what I like to do. And I remember at the, t- and, um, and, his, and, and what he offered, is, so he, t- he spoke about some of the difficulties engagement with parents and things. And he said, well, Tahir, if you want to help us, uh, you know, you could, he didn't want me to become a governor. I didn't suggest that anyway. Uh, although there were vacancies at the time, but that's not something that he mm-hmm. encouraged me to get involved with. But he said, well, you know, we could, you could help us with meeting some parents. Maybe we got uh, attendance issues. 
you know, uh, uh, the absence rates are very high and perhaps you can work with some parents and something like that. That was the conversation mm-hmm. I had with him immediately after this um, uh, Trojan host moment, or sorry, Damascus moment, <laughs> I should say, uh, after this moment. So I, 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 this is like a, so I was, so I was unsuccessful in trying to that get... That was 1993. 93, yeah. 93, yeah. maybe beginning of 94. Uh, round about there. It was within a few months of mm. the program itself. Uh, so that was my first attempt anyway. So I was unsuccessful in getting in, and then I decided to do something by opening up a tuition place. Mm. And, uh, you know, I ran that for two, three years, about three years, I think. And kind of after-school club for, for kind of bringing... Yeah, it was within the community, really. Yeah. But I just was I, was... I sort of became motivated to try and do something to address the catastrophic education <coughs> failure where the results of not just this school, but other schools as well, were very low. What but does very low mean? Uh, low means that the results of this particular school were always in single figures. That's 4%. So 1997, the year I joined and became chairman on the 7th of uh, January 1997, the results of the school were 4%. What does that mean, 4%? The 4%, percent, 4 of the children get five grade A's to C. Okay. Uh, in so correct subjects. me if I'm wrong. That was the worst in the country, or something. Like One that. of the worst in the country. One of the worst. Uh, in the country. And this particular school, you got to look at the trajectory. So it's not like a flash in the pan or something. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. The status of this particular school has been has been like that. Uh, for a couple of decades, mm-hmm. because in 1992, only one child passed wow. in the whole school, just one. So it was 1%, uh, and that's a matter of record as well. So there was a two decades of failure. A generation failure is what we're talking about, mm-hmm. and that's something that we kind of wanted to address and, 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 and uh, turn yeah. around. Can, can I just come in there? Because yeah. I think it's incredibly important because the program, the Panorama program itself, was deeply unpleasant deeply hostile to British Muslims and was talking about the threat and the risk that underachievement represented. So what you have to understand, the trajectory goes from the threat of underachievement to the threat of achievement. (laughs) And that is, uh, so the one constant in it is behind the threat are Muslims. Mm. I mean, one of the whether things they succeed, whether they fail yeah. or whether mm. they succeed, they're a community if that's suspicious. If you if you, suspicious. if you if you if you if you put that those two options uh, forward, one of the things that really kind of struck me in the podcast was, I don't know if this is a fair assessment, but it felt that for some people or some classes, maybe like the you might call the establishment or whatever, that. Un- the only the only acceptable good type of Muslim is a slightly underachieving one, who you know kind of mm. doesn't doesn't put their head above the parapet, mm. who goes into the kind of you know mm. becomes a taxi driver or, or, or a chicken shop owner or whatever. But if you try to kind of succeed a bit more and and and, mm. and raise standards, now you're a bit more of a threat than than I, th- I, I think it's even worse than that, if mm. I may say so. The only acceptable Muslim is the one that they currently agree with. That is, that anybody who steps into the public space is always at risk of being undercut in the public space. They can't speak out and criticise. Any kind of deviation makes them Mm. at risk Mm. in that situation. And so just say when... You know, Tahir says, yes, the school had extraordinary achievement. Remember, this is in a context where Sir Michael Wilshaw, the <laughs> Ofsted uh, inspector, ch- head inspector at that point, had been castigating schools for arguing that, uh, you know, uh, social factors were an explanation of poor results. The one school that <coughs> illustrates <laughs> Michael Wilshaw's point is Parkview School. In 2012, when a new Ofsted inspection regime is introduced, let's just pause there, a new Ofsted regime inspecting according to the criteria put in place by Michael Gove in consultation with uh, Michael Wilshaw, Parkview comes out as the first outstanding school in in that regime. Michael Wilshaw says all schools in the country should be like this one. Mm. Michael Wilshaw two said years, that. Yes. Two wow. years later, he's saying the schools in Birmingham, 
in Birmingham mm. are irredeemably awful. Mm. I mean, and it, it's just, a, mm. it's absolutely extraordinary. Yeah. And mm. his inconsistencies, his uh, dishonesty is not called out in any yeah. of the... I, I want to get in, uh, a bit deeper into some of these points that are coming out. So, I mean, this was just by way of kind of an, a lengthy introduction, I guess. But one thing that um, uh, you know, I was, I was I put out on some some WhatsApp groups that you know uh, we're going to have Professor John Homewood and Dial Alam in, and, and we got lots of good questions. And one of the um, uh, one of my friends he said, "I really I'm really interested in hearing why John Homewood, Professor John Homewood, uh, as a you know uh, as a self declared." You know, um, non-believer. I think you're agnostic or something. Why? So why further than that? Yeah. <laughs> atheist, atheist yeah. yeah. Secularist, yeah. liberal person. Why do you care so much about this, this uh, event, this this cataclysm in history? Uh, I, I, why do you care enough to dedicate so much life, energy, and time and and research effort uh, into this? Well, there's one. Simple. So even if I didn't have a religious education, mm -hmm. I think I had a good upbringing. And part of that upbringing was that you had to stand against injustices. An injustice against one community is an injustice against your community. And we can see that in the way in which Prevent is unfolding. Mm -hmm. Prevent mm -hmm. begins with uh, British <coughs> Muslims and it then gets extended to any group that represents itself in opposition to the... Uh, government policy is at risk of being called extremist yeah. and being brought under and subjected to prevent. So that was what I believe the issue I of injustice is for all of us. Indeed. But of course, it is hard to stand back. You know, I was in Birmingham. I, was rel I arrived in Birmingham in 2005. As a sociologist, one of the first things I wanted to do was find out about this community. Mm -hmm. I am secular. Sociology as a discipline is secular. I'm interested in social justice. So I thought I have to learn the language of other groups concerned about social justice. So, and it quickly became uh, clear to me that uh, all um, ethnic minority, minority religious groups were bilingual. They could mm. speak religion and they could speak rights. I was monolingual. I could only speak rights. And it w it's a sort of um, arrogance if I assume that my language is the one that, other, that others have to pass their voice mm. and their language into mine without me wishing yeah. to learn about that language. And in the course of it, you know, I didn't in the course of it become a Muslim. I didn't convert. But what I did become converted to was how the commitment of Muslims and other teachers, because it wasn't only Muslim teachers who mm. were involved in this, their commitment to children, their commitment to the community was a shining example. And the results showed it was a, that shining example. So I yeah. became, you know, so I became involved, I hope, because of who I am, mm -hmm. and also mm -hmm. because in that process I could recognize who uh, people from different backgrounds, different religious uh, convictions, mm -hmm. who they were, and that we were actually pretty similar in what we wished for. Absolutely, that's, that's a, a good perspective. So you moved, you actually moved to Birmingham in 2005, but isn't it like a no-go area? At this point, ah, right. we, gave him, we gave him a passport oh, so he would enter, yeah, a permit for a couple of years. Yeah. <laughs> you were mentioning a funny story about no go. Yes, because one of the things, you know, I, so I involved myself in a lot of interfaith activity uh, in Birmingham, partly through the um, uh, Archbishop of Canterbury's interfaith advisor, uh, who, was, as, uh, who, who was based in, at Springfield Church in uh, Birmingham, Toby Howarth, and so we organised a number of events. And one of the things I was, we were interested in was uh, how was conversion managed. And obviously, as a good secular person, I said, well, "Well, Toby, why, you know, why not just not convert?" And he said, "Well, <laughs> you have to recognise for me and for my sort of Muslim colleagues, our religion is the greatest truth in our lives." That's what we want to bring to other people. And I thought, mm. wow, that's sort of important. Yes, it is, again, a form of arrogance for me to say, 
why that you should not speak about the thing that's important to you. But then, so, so what we do is we provide a framework within which uh, young people or people who do convert can be supported, mutually supported, because they're going to experience difficulties mm. with, within their families, within the community, mm. and so on. But the language of no-go areas was coming up, and there was a, an evangelical group from uh, Wales which was incredibly motivated by <laughs> the idea that there was a no-go area, and so they would go in. So they organised a demonstration on Alum Rock Road to prove that Alum Rock was not a no-go area, and they organised it for a Saturday morning. They obviously had no experience of Muslim <laughs> community, so they organised, they turned up at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning on <laughs> Alum Rock, places shut. Oliver Rock <laughs> Road, everywhere... <laughs> There's yeah. not a single person there, <laughs> except for a group of uh, Christian evangelists from Birmingham who said, you're not welcome here, this is not a no-go area, we have perfectly good relationships with our Muslim friends mm. here. And that was mm -hmm. Toby organising mm. that. And, I th and I, uh, you know, that's you know, part of, wow, uh, Birmingham is such an interesting mm. place to... Yeah. Uh, to be, and there are things that are being worked out that are not part of the national mm. discourse mm. because the national discourse is not about a multi faith city, which Birmingham was, which also had what I would call a much higher degree of religiosity mm. than other cities in, mm. in Excellent, in excellent. So, um, the <laughs> I'm just trying Indeed. to process uh, how much should I uh, um, allow uh, such Indeed. praise of Birmingham to go uh, unchallenged. <laughs> but uh, it's all in a, prem I mean a friendly kind of atmosphere. I mean, the Birmingham demographics really, uh, Professor, sort of indicated uh, something about them, which is that 40% of all children in Birmingham schools are of the Muslim faith background Okay, in mm -hmm. schools. So it's a very high, densely populated kind of area. The inner city areas are like that. Um, uh, so Parkview was one of those schools which had 90, I think at, at yeah. uh, the year that this happened, I think 90, uh, 98%. 98.9. 98.9%. Yeah, wow. Children were of the Muslim <coughs> faith background. So that's the context we're talking about when people talk about infiltration, you know, the whole idea mm -hmm. of the Trojan horse that you are getting in to destroy the school. We did quite the opposite. There's a lot of ironies here mm -hmm. in this whole episode, and Professor pointed some of them out, and this is the other one as well. That you know, the idea of the Trojan, you know, you're going to destroy, but we went in and we built the school. Mm -hmm. And uh, the, the, the funny thing is that uh, I went into this school, it was in special measures, uh, and uh, with a 4% result, and when I resigned from this school in uh, July 2014, the school had a result of, uh, you know, 75%. Wow. Uh, and it was also in special measures as well. Mm -hmm. So this says something about Ofsted. Mm -hmm. So school 4%, it's in special measures, 75%. It is still in special measures. So I left when I was at school in special as I joined when it was in special measures, and I left when in special measures, mm -hmm. but a very different school. And uh, the, the, the strange thing is that <coughs> it, it says something, because one of the things that people have argued, you know, in the legal case of trying to pr ban people and bar people and so on. Ofsted inspections have been used as a measure to say that there were certain failings, you know, in relation to safeguarding and these kind of things. Um, uh, and, and I've always contested and challenged mm -hmm. those cases because they are not based, based on any actual reality, okay? Mm -hmm. You can't give me a single child that was harmed or was uh, impacted by any safeguarding breach of any description. So, they, so these are just hypothetical things. You mm. know, or there, were, there is a risk, or there isn't that in place, there, there might be a risk. Yeah. So it's all hypothetical. Uh, but what happened was that the school was put into special measures when it was at 75%. And uh, <coughs> when the school results dropped down to uh, in the 40s, uh, guess what? About a year and a half later, school was judged to be good. Wow. With, with results in the 40s. See, that so this shows the of credibility of Ofsted. Well, yeah. It's uh, interesting because it's judged to be good because they reintroduced contextual factors, which they, Michael Wilshaw had originally said, no, schools can be excellent despite their context. Mm. Now, 
in order to represent a school as good, they say, well, it has to be judged in terms of its context. Right. So it's not good against uh, uh, you know a, a scale of all schools. It's judged good in the as, uh, against the scale of schools Indeed, of yeah. the uh, characteristics that it wow. has. And here's our rapid fire new enter new jingle uh, here. <laughs> I've got a few questions. Okay, and the idea of rapid fire is rapid fire is to get that kind of quick visceral reaction, automatic reaction. Right? It doesn't matter if it's if it's a bit embarrassing. You, we can bleep it out or uh, you know or just uh, have a laugh at your expense. But uh, yeah, so I ask a question and you both uh, quickly just blurt out the the, the answer. That uh, so first one for example, easy one. Favorite drink? Yeah. Beer, <laughs> Rubik and mango. Rubik and mango. I think you're the first person. Is <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought I'd be try beer first. <laughs> All right. I have to say, after a quite a lot of um, interactions with you know Trojan Horse, yeah. and we were touring the play of, of Trojan Horse, and you know at the end, all very intensive. Oh, I really need a beer. <laughs> <Yeah>. You know, <laughs> we can go for a pint later. Yeah. <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, a pint of Ben and Jerry's. All right. Favorite food, fish. Yeah, fish. Fish. Are you trying to say fish Masa- and chips? Masala fish with masala naan. Masala fish, yeah, yeah with naan. Masala. <laughs> okay. Uh, cake or matai? Ras malai. Ras malai. Do you know what this? <laughs> Don't know what that means. I should. Next. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you were a sociologist. Kind hey, of thought a, I was a sociologist. Thought yeah. I'd. You I went. I the pro- your problem is you went to Alan Rock Road at, uh, at nine a.m. in the morning. Yes. In, uh, <laughs> on a Saturday morning. <laughs> So uh, that's when everyone's uh, hungover from the, the biryani last night. All right, this one's for Tahir. If Pakistan cricket team were playing Engli- in the English cricket team, who would you support? I've always supported Pakistan, actually. But England are playing uh, another team other than Pakistan that I normally support England. Okay, good. Nice diplomatic answer. Is that because some of your friends have infiltrated yeah, the Engl- no, English it's not team? <laughs> yeah, it's not a <laughs> diplomatic answer. It's what I've always done. Okay. <laughs> uh, this question is for both of you. What's your favorite ancient Greek tactic of invasion involving a giant wooden structure? I, I think I've gone more for a phalanx. <laughs> just, you know, because in a sense, mm. one could think of the Department for Education and its associated mm. agencies not so much as a Trojan horse, but uh, a phalanx, well protected and just uh, ruthlessly advancing. That's good. Wow. I'm reluctant to say Trojan horse, <laughs> although when I went in 2016 to um, uh, to um, Turkey, I actually took the trouble of taking a dray tripper <laughs> and went to Troy, um, you know, mm. following all of that, just to see the historical places and mm. things. And I have a picture of that as well. Wow. But I probably wouldn't use the uh, Trojan horse strategy, really, for, <laughs> for I conquest. I mean, it's been done. <laughs> yeah. It's been done. If, if a giant wooden horse turns up at your, at your gates now... I just say, the thing is, of course, everything, w- as we will reveal further in the conversation, everything was done openly. So the idea yeah. of mm. a Trojan horse is absolutely extraordinary. Yeah, I mean, yeah. I wrote a book about it. You know, th- you can't be more explicit than that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I published a book. Please go to the book uh, published by the Muslim Council of Britain, Meeting the Needs of Muslim Pupils in State Schools. Yeah. Yeah. I said what the rationale for that, what the argument for that, and yeah. th- that particular publication, it went to all the local authorities. We yeah. gave it to uh, thousands of schools at the time, and we promoted that as well, and we wrote that book by consulting various uh, you know, people within education as mm-hmm. well. And mm. we, we put forward a rationale why it was important to include and cater for the needs of Muslim children within schools as a means of empowerment, as a means of yeah. you know, increasing their belonging, and as a means of uh, uh, she, uh, uh, you know, increasing the academic achievement and performance uh, uh, of the children as well. So there's, there's nothing secret about that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I was working also as a uh, you know, NLG uh, national leader of governance, is one of 200 people in the country mm. uh, appointed by the Department for Education to support governance uh, and improve governance in other schools. Um, and I said already that I was working as an officer inspector. I responded yeah. to many <coughs> consultations. I was a regu- regular visitor to, uh, to the department's offices as well. So yeah. I was not actually somebody who was hidden. 
Uh, I was very open and transparent about what I was doing um, and argued for those things mm. uh, with policymakers, uh, you know, quite readily. Yeah. So, g- excellent. That's a good segue back to the, the timeline now. So you were doing all of that um, work when it, when it comes to, you know, improving school standards and, and you know, um, uh, helping schools or failing schools even um, bridge the, the gap of communication and representation between the, the pupils and the you know the leadership of the school and the, and the teachers mm-hmm. and so forth, and then one day in two thousand thirteen, this, you know, how did it unfold for you? Where, where were you when you heard the first uh, kind of whispers of this Trojan horse <laughs> plot? I mean, the first. Uh, how did it impact you? I mean, the first thing that happened was on the twenty third of February. I remember it very well, uh, and uh, there was a short article published by the Telegraph. And uh, in that particular article, the content was very, um, uh, quite odd, really, that he was talking about uh, discrimination against uh, non-Muslims by Muslims within, within the school. Mm-hmm. And uh, its author was uh, Richard Kerbaj and uh, Sean Griffiths. Now, Richard Kerbaj mm-hmm. is somebody who writes on security and extremism mm-hmm. and radicalization and terrorism. That's what he writes about. Yeah. So... <coughs> and uh, so I kind of picked that up, who he was. So um, so I did become a, a bit concerned. He kind of made a note of that. I, I remember that quite well. <coughs> then I began to um, sort of just phone people and see if what was going on you know, around. And then somebody actually, just pure coincidence, um, on the same day, uh, I think our principal received a call as well. And somebody wanted to uh, ask her about... Uh, you know, extremism and radicalization activities within the school. And she, she rang me immediately and she became quite fearful and quite frightened, actually, mm-hmm. the line of questioning uh, that she was, uh, 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 you know, th- at the end of. Uh, so it was on that day that um, uh, we came across the Trojan horse letter. I just happened to mm-hmm. speak to somebody and they said, oh, there's some letter circulating about you. And I said, I don't know of anything. So, um, so I rang a few people. And they said, local authority knows something about it. So I, I phoned one or two uh, people I knew. And they said, oh, yeah, yeah, I've seen it, actually, but I don't have a copy of it or anything. But anyway, cutting a long story short, mm. w- on the same day, by about 4.30, 5 o'clock, w- I got hold of the letter. And uh, so we kind of looked over the letter. And uh, the content of it was you know, what it is really, and uh, and people come, uh, mm. not to go into that, but I was depicted as the mastermind who's to trying to take over, aggressively take over schools, and to run them along, you know, Islamic, like Islamify them, so to speak, uh, and that I was uh, uh, adopting aggressive strategies, and that hi- I had friends in high places who were my accomplices within the local authority, that they were kind of my students. Any friends my in Stooges. Nottingham University? <coughs> uh, well, uh, not at that time. Not at that, no. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so um, maybe they had a they were secret. To <laughs> 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 I d- it's is an in- it's an interesting narrative, and it yeah. uh, and it's something there that has troubled me since I you know listened to the podcast as well because the letter goes to the the council in in November, <coughs> and it's quite clear that the letter is direct. It's not directed at. Uh, uh, the Department for Education. There's hardly anything relevant to the Department for Education except it begins with a reference to the Academy's programme. But it doesn't say very much mm. about it. Everything else is connected to processes within Birmingham City Council. At some point, it is stated that the letter goes to every head teacher in uh, uh, Birmingham. And it goes to those head teachers before it goes to Michael Gove and the Department for yeah. Education. And it also goes to the uh, National uh, Association that represents head, head teachers. Now, the significance of that, which has just struck me from you know, hearing Tahir speak, is that the letter actually doesn't go to the... It doesn't go to all head teachers. It doesn't go to head teachers that are going to be implicated in the letter, schools that are going to be implicated in the letter. So there's a selective, there's a strategy towards Birmingham City Council, but there's also 
a selective strategy in terms of mobilizing other head teachers uh, in Birmingham. And I suspect that becomes part of the process by which the flames of the Trojan horse affair yeah. can be fanned because you've now got a lot of people in Birmingham being, uh, you know, forewarned or informed about mm. this plot before Birmingham City Council investigates it, before they go to the Department for, for Education. So Hamza Sayed and Brian Reed in this um, serial podcast, um, uh, kind of funded by New York Times, they did a huge kind of piece of uh, investigative journalism. You know, I think they spent four years and half a million pounds, something like that. Mm. You know, just. Um, I mean, I got really fed up of them, to be honest. <laughs> Quite frankly, <laughs> <coughs> the amount of trips they made to my house, I yeah. got fed up. My wife got fed up as well. <laughs> Because every, you know, I mean whenever, as whenever far as Australia, yeah, you know? whenever they encountered some new conversation yeah. somewhere and discovered something new, they would come and put it back to me again. Yeah. What do you think about this Tahir? You know, mm -hmm. because uh, they wanted to sort of cross check yeah. that with yeah. me, what yeah. I thought about it. So they kept on doing that again and again. And to be honest, after about a couple of years, I gave up on them. A couple of years. I said, look, wow. you, to you told me it's going to take a you know, couple of years. Yeah. It's been two years now, and you guys are still, you know, every three, four months here, you come back to me again, yeah. and you want to talk about this, that, and the other. So they did a lot of that. I must have done, I don't know, maybe yeah. 40, 40, 50 hours worth of recording they have of me really just putting things to me. Mm. Uh, but nonetheless, I mean, it was, it's, um, uh, I'm not an expert on these things, but I've asked... Some journalists, uh, very experienced journalists, I asked them, I said, what do you think of the podcast? And they said, uh, it's an amazing piece of work. Yeah. Yeah, and the, uh, another one said, he's a very senior journalist, and he said, it's a staggering piece of work. You know, the tenacity and the way they weaved through all of yeah. that is just phenomenal. Uh, so it's a tremendous piece of work. Which has highlighted. So you forgive them for for bugging you for over the period. Yeah, I, I think I have to do that. Really, <laughs> it, they haven't sought forgiveness yet. It's but tea I well think spent. I think that <laughs> tea and biscuits well well spent. No, I gave them samosas as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Oh. Every time they came, I always uh, in Muslim spirit, yeah. of course. I always Little them tiny samosas, triangular yeah. wrapped uh, inv invasive kind of. Uh, that's uh, right. Yeah, Pre <laughs> precious. Is, is, precious. That, is that for my benefit? <laughs> just describing what a samosa <laughs> is. <laughs> It's, it's to invade right, uh, yeah. invade the, the foreign body with some uh, Islamic uh, masala. That's right, yeah. So when this letter came, actually, uh, we um, the head teacher was very upset about the whole thing, mm. and I was concerned as well because of the securitization link. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, so we met, and then we saw this letter as well. Um, the letter bothered me less to some extent, but the media thing bothered me more at that time. To be honest, I didn't mm -hmm. connect mm -hmm. the two things, but. Uh, but I was to connect them uh, in during that week, obviously, because the f another article was published. So we met, we had an emergency meeting on Monday morning. Uh, all the leadership was there. Um, I was there as well. The other trustees, uh, mm -hmm. I think, were there as well. We met and uh, we were reviewing the fact that, the, you know, what kind of questioning was received by the head teacher and the article as well. I remember in that meeting saying that if, I said, if the article... Sorry, if, if another article runs in a few days' time, then this article is not a flash in the pan. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. it's not. It, we are in for a, probably a campaign uh, because of the nature of it. Yeah, um, yeah. And the reason why I say that, not because I'm a very intelligent bloke and I can work things out and I'm very clever and I got some foresight, you know, I'm prophetic. No, it's not, got nothing to do with that. What it's got to do with is uh, because I had, I had been um, briefed and I was fully aware of the offensive uh, by the same department, by the very same people who were to be involved in this school, they were also involved in a similar kind of operation uh, in another school called Medina School in Derby. Mm -hmm. They had carried this operation, they had done this before. Mm. And the way that school was hounded, you can sort of look at the coverage again, uh, it's very similar to Parkview, and uh, that was an Islamic, f that was a free school. Mm. So it was a school that uh, obviously came through the um, open society agenda and free mm. schools, academization program, and so on. But the leadership of that school was, again, of Muslim background. And they were basically treated appallingly. And they were the media offensive was terrible mm. against them. So, so I was well aware of that. So this is why it kind of flagged up in my mind. And, um, and I remember when I said that, our principal 
uh, at the time, uh, and uh, and he said, well, he said, you know, because the offensive was through Ofsted mainly. The school can be taken down through Ofsted, through Ofsted failure. Mm-hmm. That's what they've done over there as well. Ofsted went in, they obliterated, the, they said, put the, put the school into special measures. Once you put the school into special measures, then you can take the powers away, you can take the governors out, and you can withdraw the funding and those kind of uh, mm-hmm. interventions. You can do them. So, But you have to fail the school before you can do anything because these are independent legal entities. So you can't intervene without those. Ca- so what gives the Secretary of State power to intervene is the status of failure of the school, special measures. Mm. So it was important for that to happen. And I remember um, our principal saying, uh, Tahir, when I was say, talking about the risk, if you like, of what might happen, uh, he said to me, uh, Tahir, this is not Medina school. What he meant was that this school is very, very well run. You know, we are very well organized. We have very high achievement. Procedurally, we are good and all the rest of it. So he knows the school. He said, this is not Medina. Mm-hmm. So Ofsted are gonna have diffi- uh, will have difficulty putting this school into special measures. We can't go into special measures. This was his kind of mm. uh, uh, response. Yeah. It's, I mean, it, it's really interesting what you say by, uh, about Ofsted. And one of the interesting aspects about the organization of education, people believe that these are, I mean, their body is commissioned by the uh, Department for Education. So Ofsted is a division of the Department for Education, but Ofsted inspectors at that time were not employed by the Department for Education. So uh, listeners, if I say one of the big providers of inspectors was Serco, Serco Inspectorate. In 2015, I believe, Serco has its uh, inspectorate uh, license uh, withdrawn, and it has... No, and that receives hardly any coverage in the press. So there's major issues going on within the Department mm-hmm. for Education around that. But if you were to say, well, what I want to do, and you know, this is would would be an interesting. Uh, I want to look at the Ofsted report in 2012 when the school was outstanding, because it will clearly the Ofsted report in 2014, two years later, will outline how the school has changed yeah. and. It's not that the 2012 uh, inspectors were asleep on the job. After all, Wilshire came and specifically congratulated the school in the light of, of, of that inspection. You can't now find the 2012 in- Ofsted inspection report. It's removed from uh, the gov.uk website because Parkview School no longer exists. It's replaced by another another school presumably people have done some FOA, FOIs I, I've got it uploaded on uh, my personal website john.holmwood oh sorry johnholmwood.net okay. and there's a resources of the documents that are difficult to get hold of there so you'll find the Ofsted report there ah. but it's interesting they do have the, f- the last Ofsted report which is a school going into special measures there are four sets of criteria against which a school is judged outcomes teaching quality uh leadership i can't quite remember the the fourth but two safeguarding uh, safeguarding yeah Yeah. so what are they to do with um uh, you know the uh judgments about teaching and uh uh, uh, and Outcomes. outcomes They managed to reduce those from outstanding to good, despite the fact that the results that they have are indicate uh, that they're the same as the previous uh, when it was 2012. So it gets reduced at that point. Mm. And that reduction mm. enables them to, in a sense, downgrade the overall score. Cause so they give you know failing mm. scores for safeguarding and and management. The mm-hmm. question I always put, well, is it likely that a school that is um, has incredible academic outcomes and teaching. incredible teaching is badly managed? <laughs> it's not really, <laughs> it's, not, it's not plausible, is it? So the one issue Unless is safe. Unless the, 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 the children themselves 
Well, <laughs> one issue is safeguarding. Yeah. So that's the only issue. Mm-hmm. Safeguarding, they have suddenly shoehorned prevent. How does a school address prevent? Now, yeah. where, what were the requirements on school for prevent? I happen to know that the Department for Education did a report on how schools addressed prevent. There was a prevent toolkit toolkit available to schools. Oddly enough, or maybe not oddly enough, that toolkit was used within Parkview. The report on schools said 58% of schools, this is a report published in 2011, so two years before, that 58% of secondary schools in England have nobody trained in prevent. Did Parkview School have nobody trained in prevent? That's not correct. They did have somebody yes. trained in prevent. They didn't have enough people trained. It's a bit like the argument, undue religious influence. Mm. You know, Not quite sufficient prevent compared to the zero at the majority of it's secondary it, it, It's vague enough school. to allow you to change the goalposts. Yeah, but you change the goalposts without providing mm. any reference mm. to the benchmarks that are available within your own mm. you know department for yeah. education so it, it's uh, you know that's i think the term is you know smell a rat i mm. mean that's a moment where you see there's something really problematic and then of course as it unfolds the headlines the jihadi video being recorded in the <laughs> school turns out to be a panorama program yeah. not the underclass in Perda this time another panorama program being recorded at the request of west midlands police who are coming into the school to do a se- session yeah. with pupils about the dangers of radicalization so and this this so came it, out during a disc- so michael gove commissioned peter clark to mm. do a review Mm. And he went in and looked, and, and these are the types of examples he found in his report, in his investigation, to say, oh look, yeah, there was something uh, fishy, right. uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, happening there. So, uh, you know, this this is an, a, a prime example. I remember from the podcast. I think it's absolutely outrageous. You know mm. that they're saying these, they're bringing out these headlines, jihadi video shown uh, in in a school, right? But mm. who well asked for it to be shown? Some, someone yeah. from the police. Yeah, the issue is that uh, the, the uh, we're talking about the credibility of the Clark report. So yeah. in, in response to the podcast, some of the newspapers asked the DFE to respond mm-hmm. uh, to, uh, to, to their article and to have input. So the DFE are basically uh, pushing out the same idea, uh, so, sorry, are pushing out uh, quoting uh, Peter Clark's report mm-hmm. and other reports. Now, Peter Clark obviously collected a set of allegations, not a facts. Yeah set of allegations, because Peter Clark was not prepared to the dismay of the Department for Education, to the dismay of Department for Education, he was not prepared to go on the stand and defend the report that he produced, because they were just allegations. He never corroborated a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Maybe s- some stuff he did, but a lot of stuff he didn't. And I know that for a fact, because some of those things um, mm-hmm. you know, relate to me as well. So, for example, this idea of girls not being permitted to participate in a coaching lesson, as an example, for, uh, for tennis. I remember they that. They said the yeah. member of staff yeah. was suspended. Nobody was suspended. <laughs> in fact, the head teacher, the fact is that the head teacher apologized to the member of staff involved because he had to come back. Because school had a policy of single gender provision for PE, PE. which vast majority of schools have yeah. in the country. So because it's a breach of policy, uh, and uh, some of the other individuals who actually were coaches they were, in fact, um, they were sort of 17-year-olds. They were, you know, year th- 12, 13 students. Yeah. Uh, so so the, so the member of staff said, no, we, and, and that was mm-hmm. rearranged. So it's really a non, non, non-issue, to be honest. It, they came back, they rearranged it, and they went back again. And that was the end of the matter. But Peter but Clark, Peter Clark, re- Peter Clark records in his, in his mm-hmm. that the person who actually brought them back, they, the, the, the member of staff was castigated, she was a female, and that she was suspended. Now, I'm the one who would be, um, has to be involved in the suspension. Nobody was suspended. Nobody is named. So these are, uh, you know, complete lies that are being put into Peter Clark's report. So, when the t- when the so, so this is one example of that. The other one, by the time 
the uh, Panorama program became a terrorist video, <laughs> a, a patent terrorist video in Peter Clark's report. By the time it landed in the Houses of Parliament, uh, on the lips of the minister, of course, uh, it had become a video that was shown to pupils. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and this was, uh, you know, completely inappropriate. It's a safeguard issue, yeah. and so on. So, so you can see what a panorama video has, mm -hmm. has morphed into um, uh, a terrorist video, which obviously was shown to the pupils. Yeah, which uh, it wasn't. I of think course, I no, no, of course he wasn't. I mean, you've you, you've dedicated a considerable amount of attention to Peter Clark's report as well, and you yes, must be because I have to say, and and um, Ian Kershaw shouldn't get off lightly. His report is equally dreadful, and they're mm -hmm. dreadful for the same reasons. You would imagine that if you're going to report on such a serious issue, you would want to set a series of benchmarks. You'd want to say. What is the process of school improvement? What are the policies involved in it? How uh, is the academy's program related to that? You'd want to ask the question, how can a school take over another school? The only <laughs> way it could take over another school is that it's identified as a sponsoring school by the Department for Education within the academy's program. And then... Yeah. That is all signed off. Now, the one thing I know about that kind of process is that there will also be minutes and memoranda associated with it. Uh, Michael Gove won't get a piece of paper on his desk saying, please sign this approving the takeover of the school without there being a whole background of documents associated mm. with that. Approvals of how the practices of a successful school are going to be transferred across. Where is there any discussion of that in either report? Not a Even though it's part of the public record? Uh, yes, it's yeah. not the end. Absolutely. I mean, these orders that John is talking about, I yeah. signed those orders. Yeah. So the yeah. academization of Nansen, yeah. I received a letter from uh, sec so the Department uh, Secretary of State, Department of State Michael Education Gove. Asked you, Michael Gove asked you to take over these schools. Not him personally, not him, uh, but, but the people from the Michael academy, academy uh, team. Yeah. Yeah. So when we applied for the uh, academization of uh, Parkview School to be converted into an academy, we got the order approved. And then on the day that I was, I was given the order to sign, this is between myself and the Secretary of State for mm -hmm. Education. So he signs it first, I think, mm -hmm. and then I sign it. And this is the way mm -hmm. it is. So, so I signed the order for that. I also signed the order for the um, Golden Hillock School being taken over. Uh, and and so when I so you did you did take over some schools, which yes, is correct. By but ah, what's not mentioned is the Department of Education asked you to take correct. Over. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and what's also not mentioned is that Michael Gove puts his signature on one takeover that Tahir refuses to sign up to, and that's the takeover of Alpha Khan School. And why does Tahir refuse to sign up? Why does Park View? trust not take over that school is because they believe that that school places an Islamic ethos above academic achievement of the pupils, whereas what you know, Parkview yeah, is yeah. attempting to do is reconcile them. But notice this, the Department of Education has thought it appropriate, and indeed the minister has signed it happening, that a so-called secular school, which is how Clark refers mm -hmm. to them, should take over and incorporate into its trust mm. a faith school, Alpha Khan. So there's a, an absolute extraordinary, um, I mean, I, one can't say anything other than dishonesty mm. in the process. Mm. Ian Kershaw doesn't even know about Alpha Khan. Nobody has thought mm. to tell Ian Kershaw. So Ian Kershaw, if you look at his report, I don't understand what this any of this has got to do with uh, Parkview. Here they are turning up at meetings. Here's Lindsay Clark saying stuff, like that, but what's it got to do with her? Mm. Literally, that's mm. the uh, statements you, in so the report. So he isn't mm. told mm. that there's a process mm. of the takeover of Alpha Khan, and he's supposed to be mm. investigating that, uh, you know, in mm. investigating that. Yeah, so the, the issue about the academization was that, uh, you know, if you want to depict... Um, Parkview as a kind of an aggressive school and mm -hmm. so on, and uh, we were trying to do all of that. The irony is that when we applied for the conversion of Parkview, we applied for a single conversion, mm -hmm. single school conversion. So the department, I was informed by conversion the Conversion of what? What does that mean? Conversion means that from a local authority uh, uh, run school, you become, if you like, an independent 
uh, entity, okay. uh, uh, you know, an uh, academy, if you like. It doesn't yeah. mean Which Islamic is directly, school. no, it, yeah, that means it's directly run by, you're accountable to the Department for Education yeah. okay. rather than the local authority is what it means. So it's a line mm. of reporting is different and there are some freedoms which are different. You become an, a separate legal entity which is accountable mm -hmm. to the mm -hmm. Department for Education. Mm -hmm. So when we applied for this, the Department for Education asked us that we should apply for a multi-academy trust status, not a single one, mm -hmm. multi-academy trust, so we could run, you know, uh, 10, 20 schools, you know, and whatever number of schools. Yeah. They asked us to do that. So the financial director, he, he was leading the whole thing. And he said, Mr. Alam, the department has asked us that we should become a multi-academy trust and that they will support us in, suppo they want us to support other schools. Um, Let me ask you this. Mm. This might be something you don't want to answer, but <laughs> do you think it was intentional? Do you think that someone from the DFE was trying to dangle some bait in front of you so that they could, you could take it like a honeypot operation and they can then spin it into some grand Muslim takeover and entryism case? No, I don't think uh, that actually. Or was at it just all. a kind of a perfect storm later uh, on? Of I think there are a number of circumstances which kind of combined, actually, including mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A, a policy shift, as John pointed out, that there was, uh, you know, there was the monitoring and there was the uh, sort of prevent and checking in relation to due diligence, and the extremist unit, the extremism unit, had been formed in the Department for Education as part of a wider policy. Uh, so there was that aspect, and then there was the Trojan horse letter yeah. aspect. I mean, so I think those th there are some factors I'm which kind of came together, you know. At, at I'm at going to add something here because <laughs> the paradox of it is, is one organisation that is actively involved in both policies. So policy exchange, mm -hmm. which Peter Clark had connections to, a lot of conservative. Uh, it's neo um, neoconservative. Uh, neoconservative. Yeah. It. it, it it uh, it can't declare itself as having a political ad, but it's very close to forming policy within the Conservative Party. Mm -hmm. The Academy's program is their one of their special uh, policies that they uh, brought through uh, the Conservative Party. The other is the securitization of Muslims. Now you're faced with a situation that they brought Muslims into. The Academy's program has brought Muslims as a security threat in their terms into the program. So I'm pretty sh I would be pretty sure that uh, it's becoming a, that it's part of you becoming a multi academy trust which sets the alarm bells despite the fact that the department for, for education instigated it suddenly they're concerned not just mm -hmm. about muslim majority schools but muslim led trusts and that's the that's in a sense uh, yeah. at the core of it but there's nothing but you know clark i would say covers his tracks in the report there's nothing that he doesn't talk about what the prevent duty is as far as schools are concerned their duty is mm -hmm. to promote community cohesion download the clark report google community cohesion and you refer to him talking about community cohesion, which he seems not to be aware is a duty on schools. He talks about it as political correctness. Mm. That's how distant he is. And his education advisor comes from conducting the education funding agency's reports on the trust and at uh, Old Now School as well. She is unaware of these regulations so they have an advisor who is unaware when in the senior teachers uh, uh, misconduct hearing she's shown the documents on uh, uh, collective worship and yeah. religious mm. education in school she doesn't know about them so that's another set of benchmarks that should have been in both reports mm. in community <laughs> cohesion yeah. requirement and so on they should all have been there and none of them were. And that makes them, I think, severely, severely compromised as reports. I don't say that they went out to do a job, but they were so convinced that they could get away with it, they mm. couldn't be bothered yeah. to do the basic requirements mm. of, uh, 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 of any official report, which is to consider fully 
and mm. properly the context in which something is occurred. Mm. So here you have it. Welcome to our new segment, Voice of the People. Clark alleged in his report that Park View was a secular school which should not have included Islamic collective worship. That it was overly religious. This has framed a powerful narrative that Muslims transformed a secular school into a faith school through deceptive means. How accurate is this characterization? How accurate is this characterization? It, it's just... Uh, there is no such thing as a secular school, so all schools in England have to have compulsory religious education and they have to have daily acts of collective worship. Mm. A lot of schools don't bother, and they don't bother if they have parents, as I was as a parent, who wasn't particularly bothered about those things. But if your community and if your parents are bothered, then there's a facility... There's a straightforward facility within collective worship that parents can withdraw their children. When I went to school, Catholics left the uh, mm. assembly. At other schools, Jews would leave uh, the assembly. Muslims could leave the assembly. If you are 98.9% Muslim, you have a lot of people not in the assembly. Mm. So depending upon the uh, school you know, catchment, the recruitment of students, you can apply to have a determination to have other than Christian worship, and that determination can include Islamic worship. Now look at the puzzle that you're facing. If you're applying to have a determination, you're applying for a determination because you believe in the value of the law, you believe that it's important that collective worship is important, and that it will help your pupils so you do become not simply different from a school that doesn't bother at all but you look as if you've got an excess of religiosity mm. when what you have is exactly mm. the amount of religiosity that the uh, legislation mm. requires of you and also all of this is catered for through proper processes so the curriculum is uh, was you know for uh, state schools or local authority schools is a locally agreed curriculum by the yeah. standing advisory committee on religious education who also signs off determinations mm -hmm. and it signs off determinations by looking at your plans for assemblies and so on right now why is that not part of the discourse in Clark? Mm -hmm. I thought naively, certainly Clark wasn't, uh, was badly advised because his advisor didn't know about it, but the uh, person responsible for Sacre at, uh, uh, in Birmingham. So Sacre is the religious education yes, committee, committee that comes up with the, the curriculum. And authorizes uh, yeah. uh, determinations as well. It provided evidence to Clark also provided evidence to uh, the senior teacher's case. The evidence was slightly more restricted for the senior teacher's case because she was being asked by the uh, uh, defence lawyers to respond to particular cases. Yeah. But she has a full response to Clark, which when the senior teacher's case collapses, one of the reasons for it collapsing is the disclosure of material from Clark includes seem, uh, the, this person's testimony to Clark which includes testimony that, that says the assemblies that took place at Parkview were precisely uh, in what accordance, was approved yeah. and mm. in accordance and yet the assemblies are what are, mm. you know, are, what are criticised so it's absolutely extraordinary and I'm just going to say one thing, the uh, prosecution in the NCT. So part of my ex, I was a an expert witness for mm -hmm. the defence. That doesn't mean that I was partisan on behalf of the defence. It meant that I was asked by the defence to provide criticisms and commentary on the Clark report. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The prosecution 
requested that my evidence be ruled out of court by the Speaker's office on the grounds that I was challenging a submission to the... Um, mm. a, 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 a report by Peter Clark was a report mm. to Parliament, and therefore I was trying to suppress his speech. Mm. That was the basis of... That's mm. how ludicrous the situation was mm. that they even that they were so concerned about the inadequacy of the clark report that they tried to keep mm. so how, how does someone get away with such a uh, a poorly executed investigation and report uh, well i'm just going to say in relation to the media i have a very simple set the the it's not that the media colludes from both the liberal side and the conservative side let's just say the telegraph and the guardian for uh, mm -hmm. uh, purpo Archetypes. These purposes let's say that from the point of view of conservative press and conservatives generally the problem with british muslims is not that they're conservative the problem is that they're brown mm -hmm. from the point of view of the liberal press the problem is not that Muslims are typically brown, it's that they might be conservative. Mm. That's, and so you have a pro-secular liberal uh, press, and one must imagine mm -hmm. a pro-religion, well, you know, or what has the Conservative Party come mm. to? Mm. A pro-religion mm. conservative yes. party, and Muslims are caught in between the two. Mm. I mean, this question was put to me obviously, and I was questioned about on this particular um, topic by the Ofsted inspectors and by the EFA inspectors as well. What question? The question that's been raised by Yusuf. Uh, mm -hmm, You've mm -hmm. forgotten what the question yeah, was? Yeah, yeah. That <laughs> okay, <laughs> just to remind you what the question <laughs> was. Okay, um, so you might be out of a job, out of a job soon. <laughs> straight. See what a tough governor yeah, he was. Well. <laughs> Imagine if you're a head teacher, what yeah. would happen? <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah, I was asked about all these things actually, with the whether uh, you know school was doing too much religion, so to speak. And mm -hmm. my barring order, if you like, uh, this particular accusation is made in that as well, and that's one of the reasons that's cited. Um, I remember the conversations at the time with the Education Funding Agency and the um, Education Funding Agency in particular. Um, Ofsted didn't ask me much about that, to be honest. Um, and nor did they make any judgments about that either. But uh, the education funding agency is where this comes from. So I spoke to them at the time. I said, look, I challenge you to give me one. Uh, this is what I said to them, quite frankly. And there was about four of them in the room. I said, I challenge you to bring me one thing which actually you know, is falls outside of the boundary of what can be done within a state school sector. I said, you know, I, this, I, I, yeah. I kind of do this for a living. I advise people on this issue. And uh, I challenge you to point anything out. They didn't. And uh, with respect to collective worship, for example, we've been doing collective worship for, for, for general people's record actually since 2001. So we've had a part determination. Since 2001, we've been doing act of daily collective worship, mm -hmm. as were a number of other schools in Birmingham. And the part de de determination allowed us to have what is called an Islamic assembly in the morning, to aid the spiritual moral development of the children. This is the mechanism mm -hmm. within schools that exist. So we were doing yeah. that. So our assemblies would start, like 10 minutes assembly it would be normally, just like a Christian assembly, you have a Muslim assembly, you would begin with, you know, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, we recite Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen, and there'd be a short message from uh, a spiritual message or a moral message from the life of the Prophet maybe, or something from the Quran, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. something like that. So we would, we would then... Uh, uh, you know, just a 10 minutes. So I mean, in the podcast, it, 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 there was an interview of some um, university students that had gone through that, and they really remembered it quite fondly, like, That's you know, right. just moral lessons yeah, about, yeah. you know, giving charity and that kind of stuff. Yeah, and in all the three gave, previous... It had an impact on them. Yeah. So in the all three previous inspections, mm. the spiritual moral development, the assemblies that we system that we had, was hugely lauded and praised. So in the yeah. 2012 report, the spiritual moral yes. development is extraordinary. And the, and the Ofsted inspector commented, he said, oh, uh, that was a very moving, this is the Ofsted inspector's comment. And the Ofsted inspectors, actually, we were talking about that earlier, who inspected in 2012 under the new strict regime, which was feared by schools, yeah. that he would look at uh, academic achievement above other things. 
um, and it was feared by everybody. And it wasn't a no- the inspectors that came in were not your normal inspectors either. They were very senior inspectors mm. from CFBT, from Serco, and I believe from Tribal as well, which are the three companies that had the license to inspect on behalf of the Department for Education. So they were very, very senior inspectors, uh, you know, who came to inspect, and they said this school is. Uh, so we, our own assessment for the school was that it is a good school. Okay, my assessment, we as a governors, we did the assessment. We said, well, seventy-five percent result. The result should really be about ninety, actually. So it's <laughs> not really an outstanding school. So we did our evaluation. Sound Chief like a, Chief a, 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 a typical Asian dad. Yeah, kind of. Yeah, <laughs> but yeah. My dad. Uh, funny enough, my dad said my father used to say to my us, son got a B. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, my father used to say I've worked in foundries here and mills yeah. all my life. I don't want my children to work in any factory. He said I don't want my children working in any factory. That's what he told us. He continuously drilled that into us. Um, although I wasn't a particularly bright child, actually, but obviously this drilling and this emphasizing. You know, I had to kind yeah. of go over the hurdle, isn't it? So I had to. We go don't, don't want to go uh, kind of wander into some kind of plot to uh, deindustrialize Birmingham or anything <laughs> like that. <laughs> but it's been uh, deindustrialized already. It's already happened. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's yeah. already happened if you so go to Nietzsche's Alamrock. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's yeah. right. Well, I mean, so it, the, the the narrative kind of shifted from okay, this big kind of terrorist conspiracy of recruiting and and training kids to go, go and blow themselves up. They can obviously didn't find anything with that. Then it kind of morphed towards, okay, Islamist entryism. You know, people going going into and trying to uh, kind of change the mood. And then it kind of morphed into, you know, uh, step by step. There's just too much Islam and Muslimness. Mm. Undue, know, religi- uh, uh, undue religious, undue religious yeah. influence. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Which begs I, the question of what is yeah. due <laughs> religious influence. I mean, I, c- I can just share with you what I shared with them at the time. Mm-hmm. What we were exactly doing. So mm-hmm. here is all the Islamic bits that we were doing, mm-hmm. um, and I. I was very open about that. It's in my book, Meeting the Needs of Muslim Pupils in mm-hmm. State Schools. I advocated that for uh, for Muslim children, regardless of where they were, really. That's, mm. uh, that's quite straightforward. We uh, we made provision for prayer facilities. We also made an opportunity, uh, we made yeah. facilities for them to be able to wash, wash themselves before the prayer. Um, because in the normal uh, 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 washing areas, you know, because if the provision is not right, then it makes a mess. It becomes a health and safety issue yeah. for slipping and things like this. So we made a special facility for them. We also um, used to um, cater for the children during Ramadan as well and lunch yeah. um, uh, lunch arrangements. You, you and so you speak about these things still fondly, right? Obviously, because Absolutely. there's nothing wrong with well, yeah, doing that, these that, things. Yeah. But I got to say yeah. something else yeah. because it comes up because another one of the expert witnesses is the person who drafted the. Birmingham religious education curriculum. So mm-hmm. part of the background, which we haven't come on to, why did humanists in Birmingham, why were they so agitated about yeah. uh, Birmingham? One could say well, one thing they're agitated about Birmingham about is, well, it's uh, not supposed to be that religious. Secu- <laughs> you know, There's supposed to be a process of secularization yeah. and it seems to have come to a halt in... Uh, uh, Birmingham. Worse, it perhaps is going backwards because mm. the mm. Uh, proportion of uh, children yes. from uh, uh, you know faith committed backgrounds I- I- is getting mm. higher. But there was a new religious education curriculum designed in two thousand and eight, I think, is when it was done. And one of the things that secularists don't mind, and I say this as somebody because this was what I wouldn't have minded before I sort of learnt more about it, is that. Well, we don't mind children learning about religion. What Birmingham did with their new religious education curriculum is say, well, what about learning from religion? That just shift from learning about to learning from made religious difference a source of something positive. That was the organising principle of the curriculum. Now, of course, th- all the sacre curriculums are different in different areas. So Birmingham curriculum is different from the curriculum in Newcastle or the mm. uh, curriculum in Liverpool. Imagine now, as inspectors coming in to look, you're looking at uh, uh, a religious uh, curriculum and uh, the pupils are learning from Islam learning from Christianity, not that they mm. 
had that. Mm. So you, they, you had the paradox that in the um, uh, case against the senior teachers, well, by undue religious uh, exper- uh, influence, we mean obviously some places don't bother at all, and we're not saying that you should do that. Yeah, by all means bother, but we'll take a sacre <laughs> curriculum as uh, mm. an example of what a due curriculum would be. Well, they hadn't done their research. An academy school doesn't have to teach the sacre curriculum, but Parkview was teaching that mm. curriculum. So now they've set up a, a panel inquiry predicated on the idea that the curriculum that... Uh, Parkview was teaching would be okay if it was a sacre curriculum. It was a sacre curriculum. Mm. Now they have to, that's one of the reasons why they become so obsessed with uh, collective worship and Islamic assemblies, because although they have the language of narrowing the curriculum and Islam in the curriculum, Actually, the curriculum yeah. was pretty standard in the in, in the school. I mean, the, 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 the involvement of the the yeah. humanists was a quite a, um, an eye opening one for me from mm. as an outsider looking at the podcast and you know the the, the infamous uh, Parker interviews. Uh, was it Sue Parker and um, her husband who who wrote the Stephen Stephen Packer Packer yeah. Parker um, who wrote the <laughs> the animal farm style book where I think uh, you were depicted as some kind of uh, Goat, and uh, you know they were the the and here comes the you know the rooster coming to ch- save the 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 sheep, which was of course the oppressed Muslim women and stuff, and it was just filled that the, all of the interviews felt that they were filled with a kind of still a uh, a kind of a, a colonial hubris almost that mm. how dare you know this this foreign kind of um, uh, religion uh, which you know as secularists we are against and so forth, but it felt that. It's less mm. about the religion it's, uh, and more about just someone being uh, expressing themselves in a different way, ex- expressing a different type of religiosity to the type of religiosity that uh, maybe a white secularist is comfortable with. Because uh, as, you pro- as you obviously know in terms of the sociological mm. perspective, a secularism as it's practiced in, 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 in Western countries, it's more just kind of, uh, it's, it's not completely irreligious, it's just... It, 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 some might say it's blind to its own religiosity. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. absolutely. Um, so it's it's more about kind of Christian, Western Christian norms. What is you know of dress, of of eating, maybe of you know how you how you conduct yourself in 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 society and so just norms. And and it, it, it felt more it felt more like um, um, committing heresy against kind of um, white Western sensibilities, and less about you know. Trying to take over a school and Islamize it or something. Well, Would you do <coughs> that assessment? I think what they come to is a view uh, that religion is a matter of choice rather than a matter of belonging. Mm-hmm. It's not a something that's expressed mm. with and in your community and you as part of that community. Mm. Mm. What I remember when, you know, uh, I've already said that a lot of my <coughs> fellow academics, fellow sociologists are secularists like me. So I have to try and explain. You know, what am I doing with these conservative uh, <laughs> Muslims? And I said, well, you yeah, know... You're seen as a bit of a traitor. <laughs> well, there are sort maybe of a, elements... Maybe a Trojan element. Yeah, maybe a yeah. Trojan. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there are elements of that. But, yeah. it, you know, it's okay. I just said to people, well, you know, of course, <coughs> there is no such thing as a secular school. And I would say that this is going to be almost per- perfectly the response of British youth. And they'd say, oh, but there should be. And I would say, okay, let's park the question of whether there should be. Currently, there isn't. Mm. No, but there should be. Mm. That's it. But can't you get past the idea that there should be to the idea that there isn't? What is? And therefore, mm-hmm. accusing people of doing something which is lawful is a fundamental breach of mm. you know, human rights. So you're both secular and committed to human rights. You don't really like the idea of rights of religious expression, yeah, but uh, you know, you you don't mind an injustice be being done to people. Yeah, if this case can be used to drive forward uh, the um, you know your cause of trying to get religious education, 
collective worship out of schools. So what I would say about uh, humanism in, in Birmingham, and given what you said about, well, it's really a, a form of post-Christian or Christian disguise, I would accuse yeah. them of something very specific, and I you know, mean it very specifically, in this bad faith. Mm. That is, mm. their view is a faith, mm. and they are... You know, expressing bad faith in the way that they go yeah. about promoting it. Yeah, I mean, in my own experience, you know, I've come across um, the notion of um, the notion that Muslim children should be saved, if you like, mm -hmm. from Islam. And uh, many people hold that view. We had the um, the uh, guy from Bradford. What was his name um, in the nineteen eighties? Now. Um, Ray Honeyford. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We had the Ray Honeyford um, uh, incident in Bradford where he felt that these immigrants have come over and they should adopt our values and our way of life. So when the parents requested yeah. that, you know, you should have halal food in the school, he said, no, you shouldn't have any halal food in the school because you come to our country and you need to adopt our ways of life. So I think that we have a continuation of that. Yeah, where it a feels lot of like same. Yeah, yeah. Lo it's the same thing. There's mm. no new argument here. So what you're getting from Peter Clark, what you're getting from Michael Goh, what you're getting from uh, Stephen Packer mm. is the same thread of argument mm. that, you know, you're in this country, you should um, give priority and recognize the supremacy of our values and our way of life. And, uh, you know, you can have your little subordinated or confined space within that context. But, you know, uh, we should be... Uh, so, so while they go through school, and this is also the humanist position as yeah. well, uh, they, they believe that the, these children are not Muslim. Mm. Are you with me? The children yeah, yeah, are no, that's yeah. not Muslim. They are not Muslim. They are human beings and they, are, uh, they have no faith. And school should be an opportunity mm. for them to introduce them to different things. And it's for them to choose. In other words, they should be, they should be uh, you know, uh, cut off from their parental influence, if you like. Yeah. So they have no heritage of their own. Bring their, get their bring their chemistry, biology into the school and let us then give them a little choice, yeah. if you like. So-called the liberal or, you know, autonom mean, autonomy agenda and so on. It's, yeah. it's absolutely shocking. That's what I mean by mm -hmm. saying religion is mm -hmm. a choice. Children have to have their autonomy developed so that they can make that choice. And so, I mean, it is. And, and the neutral position is what we happen to uh, yes, and, <laughs> really and, believe in. And, and when I, I, I put it to people, you know, because I had children, mm. children went to school, I could quite, you know, I'm not proud of what I'm about to say, but, you know, I, you know, it's just an unthinking thing that the school, you know, sort of reflected me. Yeah. The children went to school from. My home, they found mm. similar things in the school. There was no issue of yeah. their movement into the school, passing the school gate. Muslim children are being asked to leave their self, their Muslim self, at the school gate yeah. and to go in. And mm. it's and, uh, and for me, it's an absolutely extraordinary thing to say that a child mm. shouldn't be able to bring mm. it, its whole self into the school. I, I, I wanted to actually um, uh, focus on this. Time's running away, which is which is a I good sign, I guess. Where we're, we're uh, um, I getting do, into however, want to raise yeah. the issue of the implications for prevent and yeah. how things are much with, which is in a mm. way answering the first question. You know, well, what's how does it relate to me? So I want mm. to go to the, what the experience in school now yeah. is yeah. as a consequence mm. for all pupils in English. Yeah. And welcome to this new segment, You've Been Served. So, gentlemen, um, this is a very short segment to put in the uh, middle of the podcast, which is basically, do you remember um, Family Fortunes? Yeah, I remember, yeah. Yeah. Never so won anything there, but yeah. <laughs> Just basically, this was born out because I felt like saying, and our survey says, <coughs> or whatever, right, and ping. Remember that. So we've been doing some surveys, uh, you know, with with the with the audience, and uh, we just wanted to see, you know, how uh, uh, how acquainted you might be with some of the questions, the answers that they might give to some questions. So we'll just do two for now, um, and I'll ask you basically a, a question that we uh, gave our survey participants, and you're going to be scored or ranked um, based on, you know, uh, how many people gave that same answer. 
right? Yeah. Um, so uh, once we start, it'll hopefully be quite uh, easy and straightforward. First question. Besides maths, the most difficult subject in school is? Science. Science. And our survey says <laughs> that was actually number one. 44% uh, of people answer with science. So now, now it's Professor John's turn. Uh, the question was again. I might have forgotten. Besides maths, name the most difficult subject in school. Religious education. Religious education <coughs> was, I'm afraid, not on the uh, list. Uh, back to you, Tahir. Well, he's, this is a bit, this what, is a bit what, biased what now because he's a, he's an educationist. Yeah. No pressure. Only how, how many twenty seconds left? <laughs> I don't know. Besides maths, the hardest thing at school. Science. Yeah. So you've done science. Now you give. You keep giving. Oh, you keep giving. Answer. Yeah. yeah, yeah. About five oh, we're mm. yeah. going down. Okay. Yeah. Um, IT mm. IT is not there I'm afraid John History History is this There yes It's number Three uh, It's the third uh, Most popular answer It's 17% uh, of people Answered with that So we've got uh, Three more left Your turn um, Geography Geography is there It's uh, Joint first Joint last Sorry <laughs> It's 3% uh, of people Answered with geography John there's two more left. English. English is correct. That was number two, which is 26% uh, of people answered with. And the final one is? What about English literature? Mm, no, I guess that include probably yeah. included in, in English. It probably goes back to you. I'll give you a hint. It's another language. French. Ah. Uh, très bien. <laughs> <laughs> I could have shown my go. age and yeah. so I should have said, given what Latin. we're talking about. Latin, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, French was 3% uh, of well, people Greek. answered with that. Yeah. <laughs> Aramaic. It warmed up, so okay, so the next question is, name a food that gets bigger when it's cooked. Anyone's game? Rice. Out? Cake. Rice uh, is number three. Well done. So 8% of people uh, in the survey answered rice. Um, your, your Cake. Cake, mm, not really. No, there's something. There's some, oh, so it says um, that it's not. It's not really cake. Mm. Souffle. Go. <laughs> <laughs> Go if the they French. said souffle, I would have allowed the cake. <laughs> <laughs> oh, someone who doesn't the do the cooking. <laughs> yeah. Our house is too loud to cook souffle. <laughs> I have Tahir. no idea. I'm Tariq. not much of a. Tahir or Tariq, which one it is? Which one is it? So, something you bake. Not a cake, but not a souffle. Bread. Bread, okay, we'll give you that one, yeah. Uh, it's uh, number two, uh, with 24% of people. I yeah. think, yes, you'll give me that one. Yeah. I mean, it's is actually right. Yeah, and it's right, but it was his turn to answer. Oh, oh, so, oh, oh. Yeah. So we'll go to uh, Mr. Alam. He was he was flexing his educationalist muscles with the last one, but the cooking has knocked me out. I'm yeah. afraid I just don't. Know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Do you wanna do you wanna add any more? I think we're oh, I think we're out of time now anyway. So mm -hmm. the other the other the number one was pasta, twenty seven percent. Uh, then it's bread. Then it's hot dogs. I didn't hot, know hot dogs. dogs. <laughs> pasta get doesn't big. get uh, bigger when you cook it. It, it absorbs the water and it expands. I can I can vouch for that. <laughs> uh, rice, popcorn, that lit popcorn. You know, popcorn yeah, okay, okay we'll accept that yeah. one. Yeah, uh, yeah, <laughs> and then beans. <laughs> I don't, uh, beans, beans. I don't understand. Um, I just I thought they just came in in cans. Yeah. Um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, one of the things that uh, um, Professor John Homewood is obviously uh, well known for is he's the co-chair of the the People's Review of Prevent. <laughs> So we we can't let that not be uh, that be mentioned, and the 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 the, the, the prevent review. By the time this is aired, it's going to be maybe a week or two ago. So please do check it out. We'll put a link in the description as well. Very important uh, review into prevent. Um, but so tying that into the children, what that phrase you mentioned that Muslim children are expected to um, leave their Muslimness at the school gates, right? The I read a, a paper something about something describing the children's horse affair as a double-edged panopticon. 
right? Which was like a, 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 a specially designed kind of prison where every every uh, inmate is if, is directly surveilled upon or thinks that they're being directly surveilled upon, and what impact that's happening uh, that's having on children. What is what in your experience? What this entire Trojan horse fiasco? Mm. The real um, victims, as well as the teachers who lost their jobs and careers that were ruined, the real uh, enduring victims are the children, not just the children whose schools were turning, who were turned almost overnight from outstanding into in special measures that went from seventy seventy uh, something odd percent success uh, pass rate to you know failing schools. Um, those children, they 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 have their you know the generations of 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 of, of edu- children's education prospects have been you know um, thrown in the drain, but also those children that are listening to these headlines and they're they're looking at the the changes in their school and they're looking at parts of their identity that are mm-hmm. unwelcome, they're feeling that they have to be some kind of have some kind of consciousness during school and another type of consciousness at home. What has your experience been of the impact, the enduring impact of this fiasco on children? Let me, let me begin by most recent of examples. I received a call a few weeks ago from a Muslim teacher, mm-hmm. uh, and um, uh, she was just talking about the issues she had in the particular school with respect to uh, supervising children. And uh, she wanted advice on what she could do. She just spoke to me about that. And the issue was that the school was actually making Muslim children's life very difficult because they wanted to pray. One of the obligatory prayers falls within the school, the Dhuhr prayer, the afternoon uh-huh. prayer. They wanted to pray during lunchtime, in their own time. Actually, it's nobody's business. They can pr- do what they like. In the p- they can jump up and down and they can go on the swings and whatever. All of that they can do, but praying is an issue. Uh, and so they put a request in, and the school was giving them the runaround. So the normally the way it happens, the head teacher wouldn't say, oh, no, you can't pray in school. That's not how it happens. So this is the new environment now, you see. So the advice that they're getting from Birmingham City Council as well is to kind of deter p- children from doing these kinds of activities within school. Uh, so they are giving them the runaround. So I think th- this particular teacher probably tried to help out and uh, then she felt that you know she was being um, you know blanked out by leadership and management as well. So this is the environment, the culture we're talking about. With let's go back to Parkview School. What happened after we left? The teachers who were supervising the Friday prayer, in fact, uh, they they were told not to supervise. So no adult teacher was permitted to supervise the prayer facilities. The idea was quite simple: that it should die. If there's no teacher supervising, then he will slowly die a death and you can give them the mm. runaround. You know, hall is being used for this and can't use this today, you know, because of this reason. And that is how you kind of, pr- you know, deter people from doing those things. So these are very normal things. Another example, in a Birmingham school, local school, not far from, um, uh, from uh, Parkview School, uh, a boy goes on a field trip. And uh, he says, you know, I want to pray. I normally pray my five daily prayers, and I want a prayer. Uh, I want to pray, sir. So he told the teacher, and the teacher reported it back to the school, to the safeguarding lead, and the safeguarding lead reported it uh, to Birmingham City Council uh, prevent team. And to uh, and prevent. <laughs> yeah. So, so, th- so this is the kind so of thing we're talking about, really, yeah. which creates a very restrictive and um, oppressive environment environment when it comes to uh, expressing your Muslimness Mm -hmm. and practices which are not uh, extreme practices but are very normal practices for Muslims Mm -hmm. are being interpreted uh, by teachers because of this prevent duty they're being interpreted as being threatening uh, threatening or as being extreme or possibly you know falling within the realm of the child being radicalized if you Mm -hmm. like Mm. yeah no I mean it is extraordinary and I would say you know, the, the issue of children having to leave part of their self at the school gate is also that they are, I- it's not just harmful f- to the children, but it's actually disrespectful to the parents. It's implying there's something about what the parent brings to the child, which is problematic. Can you imagine what it is to be a parent and it, and imagine that your love for your child your care 
for your child is a matter of suspicion. And it is a matter of suspicion because prevent is not only directed at children, it's mm. directed at children in order to address the parents. Why would you have a prevent duty applied in primary school? Who thinks a primary school child is being radicalised? Go back and look at the 2011 prevent strategy document and it talks about locations of radicalization one of the possible locations of radicalization is the home home yeah, yeah that's right that is just i mean i mean that is an extraordinarily authoritarian mm. so children are being used as instruments, instruments. As, as access points yeah. for the parents and the family and yeah. and the home environment yeah. basically so so now yeah. after 2015 and the justification for the extension of a prevent duty on all public authorities schools uh, health services youth services uh, mm. um, nursery schools even it's utterly absurd right but there's that they might spell cu or pronounce cucumber wrong yes exactly as a yeah or uh, spell the word terraced house wrong yeah yeah <laughs> it's absolutely yeah. extraordinary I'll tell you a superb joke at the at the end <laughs> by the way but there's a stay tuned stay tuned yeah <laughs> there is a so as the cases are unfolding and this is one of the reasons why uh the you know there has to be such a commitment to the guilt of the teachers and to Tahir's guilt is that the government in 2015 before these cases and the evidence was tested through hearings and so on introduced this new prevent duty there are over, according to the Home Office's own uh, statistics, and this is all in our uh, People's Review of Prevent, there is over a million people trained in the surveillance processes of Prevent. That's mm. in every school. There are Prevent priority areas where there's particular attention and focus. The government has resisted saying and listing where these Prevent priority areas are. We made over 300 freedom of information requested requests, mm -hmm. and accidentally one person replied with the information. <laughs> so we now know, and we've got listed in our report, the prevent priority areas. We're dealing with you know, relatively old census data, but on the basis of the 2011 census, just about three quarters of all Muslims in England and Wales live in a prevent priority area, mm. compared with about a third of the population as a whole. So prevent is discriminatory. It is mm. focused on Muslims, and it's focused on Muslim in relation to things which are ordinary aspects of uh, Muslim representation, practice, belonging, mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. on. So it's... Uh, it's absolutely, you know, so it, it is extraordinary. And it's about what they are monitoring pupils for is not, not none of it is illegal. Yeah. None of it is, a, is an offence. And finally, they've introduced a curriculum. <coughs> Fundamental mm -hmm. British uh, values. values, which implies there are some people who might need to be brought up to speed on Britishness. But now look at where it sits within the curriculum. It's uh, to mm. here has already mentioned the duty on uh, the spiritual and moral development of children. That curriculum is now part of that duty. We have turned the spiritual and moral development of children into a security interest. That's absolutely securitization. And not only that, it is in fact a national curriculum. Academies mm. don't have to follow a national curriculum, but they do have to follow this. So we now have a security-based national curriculum, mm. British values, and I would suggest that listeners might want to just put a, uh, three letters on the end of a national curriculum, IST. <laughs> it's a nationalist curriculum, mm. it's a security-based curriculum and it's uh, mm. uh, you know and it does nothing except divide the population 
and serve electoral ends, mm. not uh, ends of mm. making the public safer. Mm. Uh, Tahir, I had one question. Uh, just, so, building on from all of what just uh, John, John just pre- Professor Homer just said, and and your your personal experience, to what degree has your perception been affected of Muslim engagement in so-called mainstream society? Yeah, do you do you feel differently to when you did, you know, during the early two thousands when you were at the forefront of trying to be, you know, uh, prime ministers invited you to to you know uh, uh, take pictures with you, uh, you know, you, the Department of Education was was lauding your work, and but do you think now looking back that you were a bit too Muslim for that, or or you would have if you were to do do this whole process again? Do you feel that? The pressure now would have been to to check your Muslimness at the door, or you know, do you, do you, are you are you hopeful well, for the? For well, the we are now within a surveillance culture, really. Mm-hmm. So um, anybody who does what I did, for example, now, they'd have to pass the filter of prevent. They'll have to pass the filter of um, being checked for due diligence, for example. Mm-hmm. So if you apply mm-hmm. for a school, if you apply for a governor, even when you apply for a teacher, you have to go through these kind of uh, checks and um, more recently uh, I came across an example where a governor you know, within Birmingham actually he was challenging uh, a low performance of the school so he made a point mm-hmm. of it you know, at a number of meetings and uh, he, he he knew me and so he contacted me and he said I mentioned nothing about Islam even in the uh, I made no mention of that simply the school is very poorly performing and I put a challenge in to say, look, you know, it's not good, and I made a point of it in two, three meetings. He said, the next thing I knew was that I'd been referred to the team at Birmingham City Council, Prevent Team, mm-hmm. and who monitor these kind of things, and the head teacher had reported him that this guy mm-hmm. is Muslim, and that he's a bit aggressive, and that he might be part of the so-called Trojan horse kind of behavior he's exhibiting. And uh, within three months, they had him out from that governing body. So this is the new environment now. So so you are being vetted, so as long as you're yes sir, three bags full sir, and uh, you know, uh, y- you're going to find it much more difficult to participate as a governor, as a parent, and even as a teacher. If you are a teacher, you're going to have to keep your faith aspect, if you like, as low key as possible. Mm-hmm. Try to avoid uh, supervising prayer facilities and those kind of things because somebody will be watching you and reporting you as well, and making a note of it, or giving you a very disapproving, li- disapproving look that you're being watched. So this is the environment that has been created. This is not education. Mm-hmm. Yeah? I mean, it's a ridiculous situation for us to find ourselves in, and the shift that has happened. So some people actually uh, are not able to quantify the impact. Uh, you know, I was in this context, I was in this environment before, and the impact is absolutely huge. Muslim teachers are frightened. I, for example, myself, um, people are, I mean, my friends who came to my house, uh, they would say, they would take the phone battery out and they would request me to take the phone battery out because they think that I'm being monitored by mm. MI5, by intelligence agencies. They probably were. And, and they probably was, yeah. <laughs> so so they, they're being monitored. So if, if the locality of their phone mm. matches mine at my house, then obviously if there are somebody working in education, these were head teachers mm. actually, yeah. Muslim head teachers. Um, th- so they came uh, just to visit me really because I know them. Uh, they came and this is, the, this is what they did before they entered my house. And I complied with their request to make them feel comfortable. I took the battery out of my s- phone and put it into the other room and they came in and um, you know, as traditionally I do of course, we had a, you know, tea with the samosas yeah, and biscuits and all the mm-hmm. rest of it. But it, it, it gives, you, gives you an idea of the kind of fear uh, that's been created uh, uh, if, you, if, you, if you are a teacher or a governor or even a parent <coughs> inquiring about a facility, you could get on the map. This, th- do you think, John, that this, this creation of a self, almost self-policing uh, Muslimness, this chilling effect of uh, displays of uh, Islamic kind of uh, solidarity with uh, whatever cause, or um, uh, you know, just challenging government uh, policy or 
just just asking for a prayer and whatever. Do you think that this itself to to create this atmosphere, would you say this is part of another Trojan horse plot to 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 spread a certain type of culture of 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 hostility towards certain groups? It, <coughs> to use the language uh, of the government, it's certainly a form of cancel culture. Mm. It there so all their discussion is about the importance of free expression and yet what they seek to limit is the expression of views based upon religious pr principles or commitments yeah. of uh, muslims in the public space i have kept saying i'm secular but part of my secularism is that i want to hear those views in the public space and i find it really frustrating that we can't have proper discussion and that we can't have mm -hmm. and that in wishing to speak with Muslim, you know that people would be wary of me because they can't be sure who anybody is yeah. and who anybody uh, can, can monitor but let I, I let me tell you I was, said I was going to tell you a joke okay and so the joke is goes something like this you've uh, concerned about uh, radicalization in a school a predominantly muslim school so you think well how could we help inculcate uh, british values in that school in the context of our worries about radicalization well partly why don't we provide military training for the pupils <laughs> in that school why don't we introduce a cadet force get them properly drilled and so on so Let's, as a first act, we're launching a new government cadet force. Let's launch it at Parkview School, now Rockwood Academy. So that's what Michael Fallon did. Launched a that's cadet right. force in a school where they're worried about radicalization. <laughs> now, we've already seen that the uh, qualifications have fallen at that school. What's one of the other things that's really good about the uh, launching the cadets at the school is it's a vehicle of social mobility and occupational achievement for pupils of low educational scores. So they've, uh, the school encouraged pupils to have the aspiration for the top kinds of jobs. I don't want to dis disrespect the job of a uh, taxi driver mm -hmm. and so on. And that's one of the things that I you know, think is so awful about the, the case is the disrespect towards the uh, parents, the disrespect mm. towards the community, because the success of the school was also the success of the parents. It's not the teachers. Yes. You know, it's the current lot of teachers who think we can save the pupils from their home and the yeah. what part of you did is we can bring the home into the school and we together as a community school we can succeed so now you've added to the range of jobs that mm. uh, pupils can do at the school they mm. can join the the british army <laughs> i mean that's it's, I mean, if, if anything, that would be the, the most supreme uh, long-term level, uh, next level kind of entryism takeover plot that would ever exist. It could, it's possibly. <laughs> you started this yeah, in motion yeah. just I, so the, the, I, these radical kids could take over the British I military. I think of it as the addendum to the Packers' uh, <laughs> uh, animal farm story. Yeah. That suddenly yeah. there is a whole... Uh, They're now getting into the <laughs> army. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we just need a, we just need some kind of a yeah. military admiral or whatever, yeah. yeah, and then that's it. <laughs> then you can then you can emerge from the shadows and reveal your true intentions all along so. with your with your with your colleague from mm. uh, uh, from the other side. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's a serious subject yeah. actually, yeah. and the ridiculousness of yeah. this approach, the entire policy, yeah. you know, is just. Uh, you know, yeah. it's just. I, I also wanted to ask you, just before we wrap up, what's your your message to the Muslim community, in particular those organisations, people, um, friends, maybe, who kind of hung you out to dry and ostracised you and your your colleagues when you know when when uh, when these allegations kind I mean, of uh, surfaced. 
Yeah, I mean, such was the fear that was created. And uh, to some extent, people were distancing themselves from me. And I can, to some extent, I can understand that. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it wasn't the best thing to do. But I think the lesson that we need to learn is that you cannot simply, as soon as there is some noise in the media, and there be other events that happen as well. So one of the things that's really important, I think, is the Muslim community needs to develop some resilience, some courage, that this must not be allowed to happen again. Uh, because this whole thing was you know, based on a, on, on a, on a fraudulent letter, mm -hmm. and it was manufactured from the top. Yeah, it was ordered from the top, and uh, the media frenzy was part of that. The Department of Education was feeding the media mm -hmm. with really confidential stuff, which pe most people don't know, but yeah. it was being released from within the school as well, and it was being uh, misrepresented quite seriously, sometimes into complete lies, and it was being printed. So the DFE was actually feeding uh, mm. uh, the, the media as well to keep the campaign going. The problem, the reason why it kind of created all this fear for such a long time as well, and that's why people backed off. So the lesson that I want to emphasize is that the Muslim community has to stand up really and also stand together as well and not run away at the first sign of Somebody says, you know, this is extremist or this is this, that, whatever the allegations might be, yeah. for them to start ducking and diving and running like mice, you know, as soon as they... I, I always say that, that that is actually what makes things worse, that prevent, I always, uh, in particular, um, people, you know, who work for prevent, when they show up at your mosque or organization or whatever, um, the, you know, you don't have to engage with them. Be polite and just tell them to thanks but no thanks. You know, mm -hmm. but if you let them in and volunteer kind of um, acquiescence and 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 uh, cooperation, mm -hmm. it's actually you know it it, it 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 hooks you into a longer term kind of relationship uh, and 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 uh, and a, a more uh, uh, sub subordinate relationship with them. Whereas I th I, th I feel that they they tend to take the path of least resistance where. If you just tell them to get lost, they'll move on to someone else and, and, and hassle them. Um, and it's also about jobs. You know, yeah. these people who are employed in these agencies, mm -hmm. they are looking for fish mm -hmm. and to demonstrate their own success, you know, so that their job is justified. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is why there's a, there's a temptation to kind of exaggerate, to uh, highlight more cases so that it proves that, you know, their job is justified and that they're doing a good job because mm -hmm. they're picking up bad guys and they're making mm -hmm. the referrals. So Absolutely. this is why this whole industry is, you know, cyclic, uh, you know, in its, uh, in, its, yeah. in, its sort of in pursuing a very damaging uh, effect, really. And this is something that the Muslim community uh, will have to kind of stand up, really. Uh, that's the only way mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you can do that and show some courage in these matters, not to duck and dive and hide. So although a lot of people ran away from me, if you like, in that sense, yeah, many did. And, uh, uh, but, you know, I kind of understand that because the, the 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 headlines were jihadist terrorist and all the rest of mm -hmm, it mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. people were just being cautious uh, yeah. organizationally it's uh, i mean uh, there is a moral yeah. hazard there i think a lot of people felt shame is this what people in our community have done and they weren't prepared to get beyond that and say no what they had done was something to be proud of so i think part mm. of this is that it happened in a poor community in uh, Birmingham, in, in East Birmingham. And I think it's quite similar to the Hillsborough affair. Mm. The story that the terrible behaviour of the fans, the yeah. terrible behaviour of these people who are not properly middle class or not don't understand British ways and so on. And now we understand that there were that you know what kind of vicious stories were told in uh, Hillsborough, the same mm. has happened in Birmingham and happened to the community in Birmingham. But it's also happened in a context of austerity. I mm. happen to think that uh, Muslim communities are resilient because they self-organize. We have this paradox that the self-organization of Muslim communities is seen as a threat when they self-organize. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. But there isn't much funding except through prevent. If you have somebody with mental health problems, there's quite a yeah. high threshold to get access to mental health uh, things. And this is the moral hazard issue. Mm. Report them under prevent. The referral, goes, help. The 
referral goes part way and then they get access to mental mm. uh, health mm. problems and that's extraordinary but i you know i say to people well what about far right extremism we haven't really talked about mm. that that doesn't get discussed in terms of a community but one of the things is the absence of uh, uh, you know the self organization of the communities which are associated with uh, far right extremism so i could say well the one of thing that i would might be worried about in the context you know where i uh, prevent person thinking about muslims is if they fell away from the mosque mm. not if they joined the mosque <laughs> if they stopped going to activities yeah. not if they you know went to those activities that's when they become isolated and so on yeah what do i say for about far right extremism well encourage them to join the methodists <laughs> encourage them to become anglican there isn't actually that thing but there are groups and you will and i think we will when shawcross reports i think we'll see some of this mm. they will start to t target religious organizations that means mm. that groups like christians against poverty will have to do prevent exercises on the people turning up to use their services, just as mosques will be required to do things yeah. on their outreach and community activities. So I think it's really yeah. scary moment, fight back. Mm. What, what's happened to liberty, freedom, and all those kind of things, and yeah. uh, civil yeah. liberties we used to talk about? Yeah. Is there any space for them? Yeah. Are they British values anymore? Well, I, I <laughs> think that uh, Conor Geerty has... Uh, uh, a rather nice expression that says that prevent operates in a pre-crime space, which we used to call freedom. <laughs> uh, that's a very uh, insightful observation. Yeah. Yeah. That's on, on that bombshell, I'd like I'd like <laughs> to say on that bombshell, mm. uh, you know, thank the guests. But I have one final uh, question. You should mind your language, actually. Yeah. Bombshell. <laughs> yes. Yeah. 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 Got to be careful. Got to be careful. Uh, what, what I say, or, uh, we'll be heading off uh, off air. Um, the the <laughs> I'll give myself that. The, <laughs> <laughs> the um, all of this, all of this, this disastrous you know, outcome, these, this, this enduring, oppressive legacy. Uh, I would call it racist, Islamophobic, um, peddling ancient kind of stereotypes against some kind of foreign invading Muslim. Based on what we, uh, most people understand to be a hoax, right? Mm -hmm. A false document. Similar to some people have uh, in, in the podcast, they described uh, you know the protocols of the el elders of Zion, for example, you know, uh, anti-Semitic uh, forgery used to to spread, you know, uh, anti-Semitism. Maybe this is maybe this is a similar one, f uh, you know, against uh, the invading Muslim um, kind of stereotype. What does accountability look like now? You know, post uh, Trojan Horse podcast, maybe there's going to be a few other series. I don't know. But what what would you, how can we, as a community, as a, as a country together, call for accountability, and what it, what would it look like? Well, um, there's something ironic. Uh, in 2017, Theresa May, in her manifesto, spoke about using the techniques of uh, anti-racist groups uh, in, from the 70s and 80s in order to challenge extremism. That is civil society movements. Now we know that the government wishes to place anti-racist groups <laughs> under prevent because that's the direction we're going. But there was something fantastic that was done in that period. And so, and that is communities self-organizing inquiries. Mm. So in the um, uh, riots in Southall in 1979, the National Council for Civil Liberties, as was now Liberty, organized an independent commission of inquiry into mm. uh, those riots, chaired by a QC, Sir Michael Dummett. He and his wife became very active, anti-racist. And they produced a report. I don't, you know, I think, well... We want an inquiry into what's happened in, uh, around the Trojan horse affair, misrepresentation and so on. But we don't have to ask the government to do it. Mm. We can self-organise it. We can get mm. independent QCs to be involved. Like the People's in Review of Prevent? Yes. 
because that was in a way modeled mm. on the, the, the Dummett process. Mm. We can do that, and we can do that based on existing documents, court papers, transcripts, and so on. And we can have them properly reviewed by... Mm. Uh, 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 properly reviewed and properly ac accounted for. Otherwise, I fear that a government-led inquiry into Trojan mm. Horse, and then they appoint William Shawcross <laughs> to do it. I mean, yeah. you know, it's... Uh, or so Michael Wilshaw. Yeah, so we just take it on. Yeah, I mean, the inquiry certainly can be rigged, and quite often they are rigged yeah. as well. So we, we know that anyway. That's just a, a matter of normality at these days, and the probability of them being rigged these days is even higher but nonetheless, I mean, we are asking for greater transparency, yeah. greater openness. There's so much disclosure which has not been done. It is yeah. still suppressed um, uh, with respect to the Trojan horse case. Mm -hmm. uh, so, um, so we are pursue, we, we are calling for an inquiry. Nonetheless, that doesn't yeah. mean we have to abandon that. No. Perhaps there could be a people's inquiry as well. Yeah. Um, this particular podcast, of course, we are trying to push this as far and wide as possible because I think it really is very. I it provides insight into, if you like, corrupt behavior, Islamophobic yeah. behavior, racist behavior uh, within local government, national government, and within the court system mm -hmm. as well. And, uh, so everyone should share around this podcast, yeah. and also the New York Times one as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so uh, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So, so it's very, very important that people... And send messages of support to, to the journalists you know, that are actually right. doing a fair job. Yeah. Uh, and I hold held to account in the public domain those who aren't That's doing right. a fair job. So yep. we all have a have a have a duty mm. on us. Yeah. So this is an important opportunity for to educate people from our own community and wider mm. society as well. Mm. Indeed, the response you know on Twitter and general social media actually has been excellent from wider society as well. Mm. Mm. And they're soon through seen through the facade, you know, of uh, the failure of British media, the failure of local government, the failure of national government and the falsehood that they peddled knowingly. Michael Gove knew full well that there was no reality to the Children Host letter, mm -hmm. yet he went ahead, ahead and launched this particular witch hunt, witch hunt to remove people who are running yeah. uh, these academies, very highly successful academies. And as a result, of course, the, uh, the opportunities that these children would normally have had for decades to come have been you know, ruined and destroyed. And, that, and the reputation of the entire community including parents, teachers, Muslim governors, and their reputation has been ruined uh, as well. Mm. And on back of, back of all that, of course, have introduced discriminatory policies, you know, which will impact on future generations. So, so the, the impact is huge in that sense, yeah. but I think it's important for the community to be educated, for wider society, because this is not... When you actually perpetuate injustice mm. and oppression, it is not... Uh, you know, eventually this oppression has an impact on wider society as well. Yeah. yeah, And it's in the interest of wider society that we create a fairer society, a just society, you know, which uh, respects and values all mm. the citizens rather than, you know, those who happen to be in the echelons of power or, or have a privileged yeah. position. So it's spread awareness, call for accountability, um, spread and join... The, the people's review or, uh, uh, or the inquiry that you're calling mm -hmm. for. Mm -hmm. um, and also you mentioned... Become teachers, become governors, don't yeah. back down. Yeah. yeah, this is not the way to do that. Don't, so we don't, don't disengage. Don't acquiesce. Don't, that's don't right. And disengage. Yeah, because this is what it's about. So, yeah. so this uh, whole project was about removing certain people who were running these yeah. projects. So we should continue to participate in these things. Don't be afraid. Uh, yeah. And th there's also a petition, I believe... There is a petition circulating here. People yeah. can sign the petition as well. Yeah, yeah. to get it uh, debated in Parliament. Mm -hmm. See, every every, yeah. every we should be firing on all cylinders, uh, so yeah. to speak. And now is a a, a special thing we want to uh, end with. It's something that I started during lockdown. I call it Muslimic Countdown. <laughs> I started doing it online, uh, just on a live stream with different um, kind of Muslim organization representatives, and it kind of kicked off. Uh, it's just it was initially just to you know, basically um, stop us from going crazy and getting on each, on each other's nerves during lockdown. But it uh, it was quite fun. So uh, every guest in this series, we're going to uh, uh, do a one round of countdown letters and one round of numbers, and we're going to have a little uh, lead leadership board. Um, so no pressure, you guys are. <laughs> have the privilege of being 
uh, well, one of you is going to be the, the the top, and one of you is going to be bottom of the league, I guess. You know, yeah. y- you guys know the, the 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 score probably with countdown. Everyone, everyone know how to play yeah, countdown. So you ask for uh, letters, consonant, vowel. Mm. There's no Carol Vordman or Rachel Riley here. It's going to be the lovely Ajmal Haq. <laughs> so uh, we won't get him to dress up or anything, <laughs> but he's gonna he's gonna. Uh, although I think he wants to, but he's gonna. Give us a letter. We'll just mm-hmm. write it down. I mean, it might come up on screen, but you might need to zoom oh in a bit. You know. It was probably going to come up on the screen for people at home. So you say, for example, you're acting as a team. You say you can have two vowels and a mm-hmm. le- uh, uh, consonant or whatever. And once the ninth one is given, thirty second timer is uh, starts. Okay. So while the number, while the letters come out, you just make a note of them. Mm-hmm. So A, B, C, whatever. And you have to make then in that thirty seconds. Uh, as long a word as possible to to win to get points. Okay, obviously if you use all nine letters, then that's some kind of crazy triple whatever point uh, score. But um, yeah, each letter I think gives you. I forgot how to do this scoring, but we'll do that in post production anyway, whatever. So le- the idea is you have to make as long a letter mm. as possible. So shall we start, gentlemen? Who wants yeah. to go first? Any with any letter, uh, any consonant or vowel? Uh, a. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can't choose which you can't choose which letter it is. Yeah, you can only uh. choose a consonant or a vowel. Oh, I see. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. a vowel. A vowel. And it's not a; it's o. So the first letter is o. Consonants. Consonant, please, Carol. Is s. Vowel. O. Consonants. See what's happening here. R. Vowel. Vowel is E. Consonant. <laughs> Consonant is Zan R. Yeah. R, my eyesight is very bad. John. Consonant. Zan H. I feel like I'm in an eye test. Zan H or an M? Yeah, H. H. Just zoom in a bit. Uh, consonant uh, was H. Um, now you want you probably want about oh you want a consonant now yeah. oh the plot thickens. P I don't know it was John you always you were the consonant so P is the the next consonant and the final letter uh, consonant or vowel once this is revealed that's going to start the timer. Yes, yeah, so I'm going to look before. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> well, that um, old chestnut. I'm going to go for yeah consonant. Consonant is X. Oh. That was useless. Okay, that's it, gents. Uh, pens down. Pencils and pens down, boys and girls. <laughs> wow. Uh, okay, so I'm going up against a professor here and a, oh. and a, and a, and a distinguished educationalist. <laughs> okay, what's the longest uh, word you have? Who wants to go first? I've got saw, S-O-R-E. Uh, oh, uh, you're not supposed to mention what the word is. You're meant to, meant to mention the... Um, the number of letters in the four. word. Four. Four. You got a four letter? Four. Four letter. Okay, so you mentioned your saw. Poor. Poor. Mm-hmm. Okay. I've got a... Well, I thought I had a six letter, but I realized I don't actually have the last letter, so I have a, I have a five letter one, which is sure. Ooh, as in very good. Yeah. As in, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, yeah. seashore. Yeah. And I had uh, we had to write it out quickly, so saying, "Oh, I had that one <laughs> written." Okay, so that uh, your your four letters are going to go down in uh, in uh, history, in uh, unscripted history, uh, which is actually the future because this is the first one. But uh, <laughs> now uh, the next uh, uh, next I round. I think is you could sell this to the New York Times <laughs> along with <laughs> Wordle. Oh yeah. <laughs> I thought I was going to get drum bait. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right, now finally we have the, the numbers round and then you can go home. <laughs> numbers <laughs> round? You're going to get a target number, okay? 
um, which is a three digit number, right? Mm -hmm. So it might be like 123, for example, yeah? Um, and then you choose one large, two large, three large, four large numbers, and it just generates random numbers. So you'll have uh, a few one digit numbers and a few mm -hmm. two or three digit numbers. And you have to use the numbers that you are randomly generated with basic operations like plus, minus, time, multiplied by, div divided by, mm -hmm. in order to get the, um, the target number. Yeah. So if just for an example, if you've got one, two, three as a target oh number, yeah, nice. and you've got t uh, the, 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 the numbers you can use, 10, 1, 20, uh, 3, you can say, okay, 10 times um, 20 divided by whatever. Yeah, I've just yeah, I forgot yeah. the numbers I mentioned. Right, and, the, and the closer you get to the target within the time period, the uh, more points. So you asked us in your survey, yeah, which were the two most difficult subjects, <laughs> and you came up with maths and English. <laughs> so you've just given us English, and now you're giving us maths. Yeah, I think this is uh, this is rigged. A setup. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, cheat. yeah, I completely uh, invented this game by myself. It's it's not uh, plagiarized at all. Ready? Mm. Okay, so you just choose one large, two large. But what is our target number? Uh, the target's going to come up or we're underneath the clock, just underneath the clock. Oh, I see. We don't get the target yeah. before we. Yeah. The target comes out um, after we've got the numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Okay. Small. One small. Yeah. There you go. So 25, 7, 8, 5, 8, 10. We've got to get to Another 10 seconds left. Tell us when it's five seconds left then. Uh, I didn't get anything. I didn't get anything either. No. Zero. Did you get anything any closer? The no. Thing it, it, even if you just do one thing, you can just get some. Well, I, if I'd known that yeah. both of you were going to get nothing, I'd, <laughs> yeah. I'd have just multiplied yeah. everything. Yeah, eight times ten. <laughs> <laughs> I got 80. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, nine, the only one I got was 9 times, um, sorry, 9 plus 1 is 10, and 10 times 8 is 800. That's what I had. 9 plus 1 oh is Oh, that's a good one. Plus 800. Yeah. We yeah. don't have a uh, 1. We have oh 1. No. 819, isn't it? Yeah, that's oh no. a target. That's a target. So I'd like to thank you both for uh, attending and uh, enduring this uh, two-hour marathon. <laughs> Just getting back into the flow, uh, I hope you uh, enjoyed it as much as I did. And uh, that's uh, Professor John Homewood and... Uh, Brother Tariq Alam, and thank you as well. At Tahir home. Alam, not Tahir or Tariq Alam. You changed the name. Tariq. Okay, yeah, yeah. it's uh, been a long day. Tahir Alam. That okay. must be another Trojan yeah. horse. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other guy. Um, okay, and thank you at home for watching as well, wherever you're uh, watching from. Uh, I've been your host, Dr. Salman Butt, and this is the new and improved unscripted 2.0 uh, podcast. Uh, if you like this podcast, give it a like and a share. I haven't said that in a while. And remember to let us uh, know in the comments below uh, if you, you know, uh, anything you agreed with, disagreed with, and any advice you have. Let us know how you like the new set as well and uh, the new kind of camera movements and fancy uh, bits and pieces and bells and whistles in the middle. Um, that's it from myself and the team. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thanks very much. Well. <laughs>